is Ian Lee. It's three minutes past six. It's Monday. It's the 17th of September. It was June, like, five minutes ago, wasn't it? 17th of September. Don't close your eyes. It'll be Christmas soon. Lots on the show this morning. Lots and lots. Up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped to save their lives. That's according to St John Ambulance. This is the same number that died from cancer. I'm asking this morning, when has first aid helped you? 08459 455 555. And the government is going to announce the end of GCSEs. It's going to be replaced by a new qualification similar to the old O-level. Now, the front page of the, the, the mail yesterday had something along the lines of end of easy exams. Really? Are exams too easy today? You can get in touch in several ways. First of all, you can email 3cr at bbc.co.uk. You can text 81333, starting your text 3CR, or give me a call 08 459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. I had a fantastic weekend. Like, like proper fantastic weekend. Sunday, it was my niece's fifth birthday. Uh, and so I, I, was, I was the entertainment uh, at a little girl's birthday party. I was, I was there with my ukulele uh, and was, was playing heads and shoulders, all of that, all of that stuff. Uh, and being the music for musical statues. Uh, little girls' parties are so... They're better than little boys' parties. There were... How many girls were there? Eight girls. No, no, there were seven girls because one girl turned up five minutes after everyone had left. They got the time wrong. Oh, it was heartbroken. She turned up in a like, little fairy's outfit five minutes past one. The party finished at one. But it was great. They're all dressed up as fairies and princesses. They're all doing colouring in. They're all playing silly ga- It was wonderful. I've got two boys. I'm never going to have that. Ah, oh, dearie me. Oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. Now... Up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped to save their lives. That's according to St John Ambulance. There was an advert that's, um, that started on TV, I think, last night. I didn't see it. Apparently it's quite shocking and it involves someone choking to death uh, at a barbecue. Well, the charity says that this is the same number that died from cancer and have launched a, a campaign aired last night to encourage more people to learn these basic skills. But would you know what to do in an emergency? Kimberly Stubbs from Milton Keynes saved the life of a student she'd been teaching at a trampoline class. I'm a trampolining coach at Kingston Gymnastics Centre in Milton Keynes. I'm also a sea cadet where I learnt my first aid. I was coaching my normal class I have every Thursday and unfortunately one of the girls just did a move, put her arm out and unfortunately she broke her arm. A lot of blood was bleeding from her arm. No one really knew what to do but I guess I was in the right place at the right time. I just kind of jumped off the trampoline with her, grabbed her arm, sat her down and just applied pressure to make sure that she didn't bleed out any worse than she did. I myself broke my arm a couple of years ago, actually, and uh, you don't think it's a a life-threatening situation. In this circumstance, obviously, it wasn't just a broken arm. There was a lot of blood. I guess that was the telltale sign for you that it was there was something seriously wrong here. I thought, first of all, I thought she had, like, got a spring or something caught in her arm. And I was like, oh, my God, why is there a spring in her arm? (laughs) And then I realised that with the blood, like, spurting out, that it was serious and I was like okay right I actually need to do something now like I asked one of my colleagues to go get a first aid qualified person and just from the other side of the gym like there was about three of us in the end and we just sat her down and why well, so I just held her arm and made sure that no more blood came out I mean in that situation I guess you go into a little bit of panic mode but then your first aid head comes on as well and you have to start thinking about all the things that you learned how important were those first aid skills in that situation I don't it was kind of autopilot because I've learned it and with the cadets we kind of went through it quite a lot that that week I'd only just done it so luckily it was quite fresh in my mind and I'd just been on a course so um I did panic at first I was like oh my gosh <laughs> but yeah if I, I, I don't know because I didn't think anyone else around me knew anything to do so luckily I did it although she could have lost her life. Essentially you applied pressure to her arm and and stopped the blood I guess from from gushing out <laughs> and uh, yeah. and the ambulance then, then turned off is that what happened? Yeah yeah um apparently it was three minutes from the hospital like from the call we made to the trampolines uh it seemed like forever yeah just carried on applying the pressure the ambulance got there as I let go someone else put pressure back on a pad and a bandage and they took her to hospital literally within two minutes of getting there. It's a pretty frightening experience and I myself admit I'm thinking now I need to learn these first aid skills. I mean if you hadn't been there did anybody say to you what what could have happened to the girl? At Kingston they gave me a card to say thank you and the girl kept saying thank you a lot. If I wasn't there 
and she could have bled out because it could have been the difference between me doing it straight away to someone not realising and having to do it five minutes later. Apparently it takes like three minutes to bleed out or something. And there is a happy ending to it as well because uh, she hasn't been put off trampolining, I believe. No, yeah, she was back. Um, obviously she was in a cast, but after our cast came off, she came back in and she was back jumping, still doing the move that she did when she <laughs> broke her arm. Yeah, she was a little bit wary at first. She loves it and she's a nice, happy little girl. Fantastic. And then finally, for, for people listening who haven't done first aid, for you, how important is it to get that message out there that, you know, this really is something that it could be the matter between life and death? Oh, definitely. If you can get on a first aid course, definitely go for it because whether you're just shopping or you are in a work situation, someone could really hurt themselves and they could really need your help. If I wasn't there, something definitely could have gone a lot worse. That's Kimberly Stubbs from Milton Keynes telling us how her basic first aid skills help to save someone's life. If you'd like to pick up more first aid skills, you can text the word HELP to 80039. 80039 for a free pocket guide courtesy of St John Ambulance. Where does first aid help you? Have you? Do you know it? I don't. I don't know. I wouldn't have a clue. I, I did do the Heimlich manoeuvre once which I think may be out of fashion these days. When has First Aid helped you? And did you see this advert last night? Apparently it was on during Downton Abbey. I missed Downton last night, one of my favourites, and I, I forgot to watch it. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> did you see the advert? Were you shocked? Has it made you think? 08459 four double five five double five. Diana Ross, show me action. We'll be talking a little bit later on about the... Uh, the Kate Topless Pictures. I was trying to work out what words I could say at 6.12 on the BBC. And, and Topless Pictures, I think, is probably the safest one that was in my head. Uh, th- th- I saw them. I had a look at them this morning. <laughs> you know, really. There's a great picture in the, in, on page five of The Sun. Uh, well, of course, none of the, the British papers are going to print these pictures. It would be... Uh, they just wouldn't get away with it. But page five of The Sun, there's a brilliant picture of, of William looking at Kate's... Knockers. Look at his eye line. Just uh, very naughty. Very naughty. Uh, 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone number. First aid uh, is what we're talking about this morning, amongst other things. Uh, and I'm really keen to know, did you see this first aid advert that was on last night? Apparently it was on during Downton Abbey. Two minutes long, uh, and it features uh, a guy um, who is a cancer survivor, and he's talking about that, then he chokes to death on a, a, a burger. At a barbecue. Apparently very shocking. I've not seen it. I'll have a little look for it this afternoon on Tinternet. Uh, but did you see it? And did it make you think? 08459 four double five five double five. And has first aid ever helped you at all? If there you any stories of, of you being uh, nearby when an incident happens? My father-in-law's a doctor. And uh, he has been on an aeroplane and in the theatre when someone has said, Is there a doctor in the house? He's going, yeah, that's me. How cool would that be? Yeah. He didn't say it like that. He's quite posh. But he didn't go, yeah, I'm a doctor. What do you want? It he, he was, he was a little bit more, yes, can I help? Uh, but has first aid ever helped you? Have you ever had to use first aid? Or have you been in a situation where first aid would have been pretty helpful, but you just didn't know what to do? I wouldn't have a clue. I don't know the recovery position. I don't know any of these things. And I suppose I should, particularly as I've got kids. 08459. Four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give me a call on that. You can text as well. Eight one three double three starting your text three CR and you can email three CR at BBC dot co dot UK. Six sixteen, these are your headlines this morning on Monday, the seventeenth of September on BBC Three Counties Radio. Up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped to save their lives, according to St John Ambulance. Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will go to court in Paris this evening to try to restrict the publication of pictures showing the Duchess sunbathing topless. In sport, Jonathan Tiernan Locke has become the first British man to win cycling's Tour of Britain since 1993. We'll have weather in a few minutes and coming up, we'll get the latest from France as Kate Middleton's lawyers go to court today to try to prevent further publication of those topless photos. BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday morning from nine, Jonathan Vernon Smith. How do you avoid the weirdos if you date online? I knew straight away he was a little strange. And I just came out with it and I said, have you actually had a girlfriend? And he went, no. Jonathan Vernon Smith. I said, well, what kind of things do you like? He said, well, I like to be a polar bear. By this time, I'm absolutely <laughs> freaking it. <laughs> 
And then he turned round to me and said, what I'd like you to do is give me lots of cuddles and feed me chocolate. <laughs> so I really am thinking, emergency number, I've got to phone to be rescued here. Jonathan Vernon Smith, weekday mornings from nine on BBC Three Counties Radio. I don't get it. What's so funny about that? That sounds all right. I like lots of cuddles and to be fed chocolate by a woman I've met on the internet. What are you? It sounds fun, doesn't it? It's just me then, sorry. If you want to find out more about this show and, of course, the station, uh, you can do. We've got lots of things on the internet. Computers, you know? We, uh, yeah. Uh, you can find us on our Facebook page. Go to facebook.com and search for BBC Three Counties Radio. We're also on Twitter. So you can go on there and we kind of post pictures and bits of audio and the topics for this show and all kinds of stuff on there. So if you're on Twitter, uh, join us at BBC 3CR. Ah, deary, deary me. Oh, sorry, so a little a little moment there, a little pause. It's Monday morning uh, at 20 past six. It's kind of like, oh, <laughs> we'll get there, don't worry, we've got plenty of time. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. My production team have just watched the first aid advert that was shown last night. Premiered um, on Downton Abbey. Apparently it's very shocking. Uh, and it's it sent tingles down their spine. If you saw it, what did you make of it? I'm guessing a lot of you watched a bit of Downton last night. Very popular television show, isn't it? Particularly with the ladies, I've noticed. The gentlemen, eh, not so much. Uh, if you saw this advert, what did what did you make of it? Did you did it make you think? Oh, maybe, maybe I should have a little look into learning some first aid. Because it w- it would be a handy thing to know, wouldn't it? I don't know it. 08459 four double five five double five. I say I don't know it. I did once perform the Heimlich manoeuvre on my mother. She and she was proper choking, a bit of chicken stuck in her throat. Face was blue. It, you know, it's one of those things where it kind of starts off quite funny. Oh come on, mum, and she's there coughing and she's giggling and then the cough gets a bit more desperate and the giggling stops. And actually the giggling continued because it was she was kind of entering a, 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 a sort of a hysteria panic. And then her face went blue. And I thought, oh, God, something needs to be done here, really. So I picked her up and did the Heimlich manoeuvre. Now, I have no idea how I know how to perform that. All I know is you get your hands into, like, a big fist, and it's just below the ribcage, I think. I don't know. And I got behind her, just behind the ribcage, squeeze, squeeze, and on the third squeeze, a lovely bit of chicken went flying across uh, the room. We didn't let that go to waste, of course. She picked that up and had that again. I'm joking. Um, but, uh, did it save her life? Well, it stopped her choking. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't have been there to do that. So, when has first aid helped you? 08459 455 555. Uh, and did you see this advert last night on Downton Abbey? And what did it make you think? Did it, did it worry you a little bit? Did it upset you a little bit? Did it make you think, you know, do you know what? Maybe I should go and learn a little bit of first aid and have a look. Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five. Now, lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will go to court in Paris today to try to bring an injunction against the French magazine Glossaire, which has published photographs of the Duchess sunbathing topless. They'll also ask French prosecutors to bring criminal charges against the photographer who took the pictures. Let's cross over now to France and speak to our Europe correspondent, Duncan Crawford. Good morning, Duncan. Good morning. Duncan, what can we expect to happen today? Well, the lawyers for the royal family will be in Paris to go to this courthouse to try and get an injunction to try and prevent any other magazines or papers from publishing these topless photos which showed the princess just wearing some bikini bottoms. She was laying on a sun lounger by Prince William at this private chateau in the south of France. Those photos have now, though, been published in Ireland as well by the Irish Daily Star. They're due to be published in Italy today in a 26-page special the magazine with the headline uh, scandal uh, at the court the queen future queen is topless so um, y- you get the idea of how these photos are spreading around the world and this injunction if it is granted will only be effective in france the couple's lawyers are also going to at a future hearing file for damages for breach of privacy and also last night saying that they would make a criminal complaint uh, to the french prosecution department against the photographer so civil and criminal proceedings being pursued by William and Kate now. These pictures are all over the internet. If I'm completely honest, I saw them this morning. Uh, But going to a French court, it can't really control the spread of the pictures anymore, can it? 
No, uh, most likely not, and certainly with the internet, definitely not. You know, 20 years ago, maybe this had worked, but the nature of media has changed now, where even if the smallest publication, you know, posts something online, it can very quickly go viral and spread all around the world. But I think the couple are clearly angry about what has happened. They want to draw a line in the sand to send out a message that there is only so much intrusion that they will accept. And I think that's also reflected in a statement given by a spokesperson at St. James's Palace who said that the magazines and newspapers who have published these photos are only motivated by greed. The French privacy laws are supposedly much stricter than ours over here. Are they likely to win the case, the Duke and Duchess? Uh, well, let's wait and see, but, you know, it, as you say, France has a reputation for tough privacy laws. It looks like, very clearly, those laws have been broken. But uh, the reality is that the penalties for uh, breaking French privacy laws are relatively low. Under French law, breach of privacy is a criminal offence which carries a maximum fine of around £36,000. Uh, the photographer and editor of Closer magazine, who published these pictures could also potentially face a one-year jail sentence but that according to uh, legal experts is extremely unlikely to happen so given you know the amount of money which can be made the amount of publicity the boost to sales for the magazine you can see why uh, magazines which you know make their living from celebrity tittle-tattle gossip and photos like this will go on to publish and publish and be damned celebrity tittle-tattle indeed uh, now you're currently in france what are the french media saying about the pictures duncan uh, real mix, I have to say. I mean, uh, well, the editor of Closer magazine, no surprise, has defended the decision to publish the photos, saying they're not degrading, that the couple were visible from the street, apparently, and also saying that the reaction has been hypocritical, given that The Sun printed those nude photos of Prince Harry in Las Vegas not so long ago. And certainly there are there is a viewpoint from some people I've spoken to in France already uh, since yesterday, uh, saying, you know, hundreds of thousands of women, millions of women, go topless around the world what's the big deal you know uh, relax uh, but there are also others who uh, feel the same way as uh, William and Kate that this has been a breach of their privacy that it was a step too far and they uh, can see why they're taking this action Duncan thank you very much that's uh, our Europe correspondent Duncan Crawford live from France this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio uh, ben in Buckingham was texting. We were talking about first aid. Uh, he was knocked down by a car at the age of 19. His friends put him in the recovery position, which helped. I don't. The thing about this is they keep changing it, don't they? The recovery position is not what the recovery position when I, was when I was a lad. And also, you, I don't think you're supposed to give mouth to mouth anymore. Partly because of you might catch, you know, the lurgy or something from you. You don't really. No, but seriously, you don't really want to start breathing into a stranger's mouth. Do you? Maybe you do. I don't know. But also, I think it's been shown that it's not actually that effective, the mouth-to-mouth, anymore. I don't know. If you do, could you give me a call and let me know? 08459 four double five five double five. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Catherine. This morning we are talking first aid. Uh, we're asking, did you see that advert last night uh, of the person choking that's to promote first aid? And coming up, we'll be talking to someone who sells Nazi memorabilia. Uh, Michael Burrows has come in. He's brought some of his bits and pieces in. And we'll be having a look and asking, is it appropriate? 08459 four double five five double five. There we go, Len Barry, one, two, three. Now... Uh, Nazi memorabilia is being sold on a market stall in Hemel Hempstead. It might sound a bit distasteful to some people, but trader Michael Burrows says there's a ready market for this and other historical military items. Michael's in the studio. Morning, Michael. Oh, good morning. Thank you for coming in at this ridiculous time of the morning. You've brought some bits and pieces in with you. That's great, yeah. Uh, And some of these are... Show me the the, the beer mat you were just showing me. Yeah, this is a a small beer mat. Just get a little bit closer to the microphone. There we go. Okay, that's a small beer mat. Yep. And I say, it's it's addressed addressed to Adolf Hitler in the Reich's Chancery. And it's basically got a small note on it that says, uh, we're having a beer and thinking of you. And they've sent it to Hitler as a bit of a joke. But the nice thing is it's addressed to the Chancery. And on the back, his adjutant has signed and dated it um, so that Hitler could view it. So that is Hitler's beer mat? It's a beer mat that was sent to Hitler and Hitler held it, yeah. Now, why would someone send something to Hitler? Was it kind of like fan mail? It was, yeah. I mean, he he would receive so much mail that what they would do, the adjutants would vet it. And he'd see a small percentage of it. 
and the the items with the stamps on from the chancery obviously are the the bits that were chosen that he could look at where, where do you get something like that from and how do you know it's genuine um most of this comes from veteran source from from ex-servicemen who collected yeah. souvenirs what other bit what was this thing you showed me you got hitler's bookmark there of course yeah that's another souvenir from the rights chancery that was picked up at the end of the war now i've got a little black box here which i'm opening uh and there is a gray gold and uh white with a bit of uh, red around it badge with a swastika on it now you see these in all of the kind of the, the war films yes, what is yeah. this it's a german cross in gold and how would w- would this have been awarded out to everyone or is no, this no it's only for gallantry right and it was awarded mainly for bravery in the field a lot of airmen got it um but it was mainly um brought out by hitler because there was no there was no award between the Iron Cross and, yep. the, and the Knight's Cross. So it was a stopgap between those two awards. And how much would this would you sell this for? Uh, that one's £4,000 because it's in the box. I've got to be honest, I feel a bit weird. I always feel weird seeing the swastika anyway. But it, it's weird holding something that was, you know, was awarded to a German soldier for bravery. For, Do you not feel gallantry. odd at all uh, dealing uh, in this kind of memorabilia? Not, not really, because... The, the veterans I've met have got no sort of animosity to their foes. Right. So then why should I have? That's, that's, that's how I sort of... Who buys this kind of stuff? Um, there are collectors that collect just certain things, obviously, in their collection. But a lot of it is now is alternative investment. Every year they're getting harder and harder right. to find. And you could, as I say, that is now worth £4,000. When I first started doing the market, they was £400. Right, right. Because uh, I know that Lemmy from Motorhead is a big collector of Nazi memorabilia. Has he popped along to your stall at all and had a look? No, no, I have sold to a few celebrities, but not, right. to, not to Lenny. Are you allowed to no. say who? Um, Ian Ashby from The Cult at right. one time. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think now. But there is, there is a few. Oh, Christopher Lee's a big collector in Special Forces stuff. Christopher Lee is. I've worked with Christopher Lee, and uh, he once told me off just wearing a pair of pants, which is one of my greatest moments. Oh. Uh, but yes, he, d- he does collect all that kind of stuff. D- are you worried <clears throat> that some people might get offended by this? What it is, I don't. I do a public market, and I'm really careful how I display stuff. Right. I, obviously, I wouldn't put a great big railway sign down there with a, a big swastika on it. And most people that collect it, they go to specialist fairs, yeah. and you don't really have to advertise. You yeah. know, there is a market, a ready market. I've got probably ten people for every item I could I could find. It's finding it's hard and selling it's easy. Do people ever come along, start looking at your stall, and then realise what you're selling and have a go at you? They do, and I, I try and explain that. I, I mean, I had, my family had servicemen in both wars. We, we lost family in both yeah. wars, and I'm the same as them, you know, and it's important to preserve it. That, that's why a lot of the stuff, as I say, I, I, when I do source it, I uh, approach the museums first because, the, you know, certain items, they go, no, that's got to go to a museum. Right. And I've donated stuff to a museum freely for nothing. Why would a museum not want Hitler's bookmark? Uh, they've probably got one. <laughs> <laughs> he read a lot, did he? He, had a well, big, uh, he would have had a big comprehensive library, but whether he read them all, I don't know. Let's have a look at this. What have we got in this tiny little box here? It's a little sort of uh, olive green box, and there is a gold badge with uh, a, a, a submarine or a U-boat that's, or a, a boat uh, and, that's right, yeah, and a swastika yeah, yeah. on it. What's, yeah. what's this? It's a German uh, U-boat badge, <clears throat> and it, it was awarded for doing two complete tours on a submarine. And that's the first patterned one, which is in, uh, obviously, the high gilt finish. And being as it's in the little cardboard box, that, that sets it apart from a lot of others. And how much would this go for? Uh, round about four or five hundred pounds. Right. But, but as I say, it's, it's one of them things that every year you can't, f- you, they're getting less and less, you can't find them. And it's only when a major collection comes up yeah. that, that items appear on the market. It's interesting, because when I was a boy, uh, it, sort of in the late 70s and 80s, the, the, the Second World War was kind of quite fashionable for kids, with comics like Victor and stuff like that, and you would play mm. war. Yeah, come and, on. And, <clears throat> you know, even then we would joke about, joke about, the Nazis being the enemy. Yeah. That's kind of moved on a bit now in 2012. Is it really appropriate to be selling this kind of stuff now? Should we just move on? I, I think it's all part of our history, the same as the Civil War and the same as, as uh, Waterloo. I think it is history and we've got to preserve things so that for future generations to view so that they get their own idea of it. What, what's that huge sign you've brought in there? Uh, the huge sign is, is from a railway station and it, it's basically saying, you know, prepare to have your goods examined. Right. You know, you can't just freely move through here. You, 
And how much? It's a big blue sign. It's got orange uh, lettering on, and uh, the, the orange eagle. I'm guessing. Yeah. What? Well, how much would that go for? Uh, Five hundred pounds, I suppose. It's yeah. incredible because yeah, it's a bit tatty, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah. But, but people will buy that kind of stuff. And then yeah. what do they do with it? They display it in their house, or, or yeah, I mean, they... They, they could go to a railway collector, someone that just collects anything to do with railways. Yeah. Or if someone's doing a diorama, I mean, I sell a lot of stuff to museums who do like a little diorama with, right. with figures, and it's an ideal backdrop. Um, Something like that. So the, what do the other market traders say? How long have you been in, on your pitch? Uh, I've been there 20 years now. Right. And obviously I don't put great big flags out and, and things so like that. So it's not decked out, because some people no, might be worried no. that you're there with, oh, no, with no, massive no, no. swastikas and no, it's, I'm you know... A, no, I'm in a public place and right. I've got public responsibility. And also I, I do... I, I can appreciate some people would get offended if I yeah. put a, a, even a, a German armband out. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't. I just... I, people that collect the stuff know whether it's there or not and they always ask what's new. Um, and the other market traders are fine. They've never. Yeah, yeah. Usually, I, I get offered other stuff from the other so, uh, the other traders that say, "Oh, is this real? Mm. Uh, what's it worth to you? Is it is it real? Things like that." I find it fascinating because it, you're right. It is history. This is this is history, and it's still just within living memory. Yeah. Uh, I, it's that weird thing of I find it fascinating, and I find looking at this this badge that, that was you know for four thousand pounds, I find it amazing to look at it it does it just it, it's uncomfortable isn't it and i suppose it's the association of where it comes from and just just how dark and bad those days really were yeah, yeah. i mean it's some of the yeah the, the it's it maybe some of the attraction to some people yeah i mean other people would just look at it as a combat soldiers award mm. and he'd have had to do something extremely brave for it um but as i say the, the collectors are they usually collect individual um things with a story and a yeah. bit of providence you know and that's what they're buying into that bit of history Michael, listen, thank you so much for coming in. No, you're uh, and it's interesting to hear that, you, you, you know, it's not... When we first heard about your stall, I think we were slightly worried that it was just going to be draped in swastikas <laughs> and, you know, stuff like that. It's interesting to, and, and good to know that you're doing it in a subtle and a sensitive way, because you're right, this, the, you know, the, a lot of people will be offended by this. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing it in. No, Absolutely no, you're welcome. Fascinating. You can okay. have that back, though. It makes me uncomfortable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there we go. That's Michael. Whereabouts is your stall again, Michael? Hemel Hempstead Market, just behind the water gardens. You there every day? Every Wednesday. From okay. 5.30 till 2. One day a week? Come on, man. Pull your and finger out. <laughs> Work a bit harder. I'll do a military fair every Sunday as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Michael Burrows uh, there with his... Uh, nine. It's not all he sells. He sells other bits and pieces as well. Well, what do you think about that? Uh, uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? I, it is historical. Uh, th- these are historical artefacts, and I guess they deserve to be preserved. Some of you, I would imagine, might be slightly offended by these things. I'm keen to find out. Is it, how do you feel about it? 08459 455 555. Is there any difference between selling that and, you know, stuff from other wars throughout history? 08459 455 555 is the telephone number. Now, BBC introducing, this is a talk about a change in tact. We go from, from Nazis to uh, <laughs> new bands. BBC introducing discovers and plays the best in unsigned, undiscovered and under the radar music from across beds, hearts and bucks. If you know anyone making music across the three counties who deserves some recognition, then get them to go to bbc.co.uk forward slash three counties and click on Introducing. And listen to BBC Introducing uh, in Beds, Hearts and Bucks every Friday evening from 7 on BBC Three Counties Radio. We're also talking this morning, and we'll be talking about this a little bit later on, it's uh, in uh, some of the papers, and was on the front page of some of the papers yesterday. Uh, there is uh, plans afoot to replace the GCSEs with something more similar to the old-fashioned O-levels, because apparently GCSEs are too easy. What do you think? Are exams too easy these days? 08459 455 555. You can text 81333. Start your text 3CR. It's Monday the 17th September at 6.45. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped to save their lives, according to St John's Ambulance. Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will go to court in Paris later to try to restrict the publication of topless pictures of Princess Kate. In sport, Stevenage chairman Phil Wallace says he's prepared for a move to a new stadium as long as the club can increase its fan base. Your weather for the three counties, mainly dry with sunny spells. Top temperature is 19 degrees. And coming up, the government today is going to announce that the GCSE is to be abolished. It'll be replaced by a new qualification similar to the old O-level. But what difference will it make? We'll hear more after... uh, Sorry, before 7. BBC Three Counties Radio. I believe this song would be filed under pop. 
Al City's back, is he? Uh, with Carly Rae Jepsen. And if you're wondering, that song is called Good Time. Should we have a quick look at the front pages of the newspapers while we have a second or two? Why not? They're all a little bit um, divided today, which is good. The last few days we've had a few that have been uh, exactly the same, and it's, it's frustrating now, it's a bit different. Uh, the Guardian, starting gun for England's badger shoot. Oh, here we go. Brian May won't be happy. Can we get Brian May on the line? Because Brian May is a big supporter of the Badgers. I interviewed him once. Get this. Uh, for a documentary I did about Vox amplifiers, part of the gig was I had to go to Brian May's house, stand in his garage and interview Brian May while he was wearing a Badger badge. Badger badge. Uh, and he had his famous guitar made out of a fireplace and he was playing different bits. And I said, oh, Brian, what happens if you flick that switch on the guitar? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, those are the pickups of Bohemian Rhapsody. And then he started playing Bohemian Rhapsody in front of me. I'm not a huge Queen fan, but even that, you think, oh, blimey, this'll do. Uh, yeah, let's see if we can get him. Starting gun for England's badger shoot. First licence expected in Cull that could wipe out a third of the population. Uh, front page news, that's interesting, isn't it, really? Uh, let's see what else we've got. <clears throat> The Times. Handover is put at risk by attacks from within. The credibility of Britain and America's handover plan for Afghanistan is under threat after the worst spate of insider attacks by Afghan security forces against their NATO partners. Uh, And there's a picture of Lady Gaga wearing flowers around her head. The Daily Telegraph. IVF babies with three parents? Controversial fertility treatment to eliminate a range of hereditary diseases could be made legal next year. Uh, and um, another picture of uh, Kate and Wills. Do you not think that William should shave his head? We, it, William, we all know you're bald. We all, and he's got that weird kind of fuzz over the bald patch. I suggest just get rid of it. Shave it all off. The Independent. Um, there's Andy Murray being licked by a dog. <laughs> There really is. That's the front page. There's a picture of Andy Murray being licked by a dog. The world has gone mad. They won't put pictures of Kate Kate Middleton topless on there, but they'll put pictures of a tennis man being licked by a dog. And children in peril as women are jailed in record numbers. The number of women in prisons has more than doubled in 15 years, with over 17,000 children separated from mothers. Uh, The Daily Mirror. Uh, we'll have to grin and bear it. Royals take legal action, but admit word the world will still see topless Kate pics. I've seen the pictures this morning, for journalistic purposes, of course. You can't tell it's her. That's how bad the pictures are. You can't tell it's her. The only way you can tell it's her is because um, William's shiny head is next to her. But you can't tell it's her. There's one as well you can see her bottom. Yes, I know. Uh, the Daily Express, new push for vote to exit EU. Time for change, admit top Tories. It ain't going to happen, Express. I'll tell you that now. It isn't going to happen. Uh, the Mail, the fat cat of foreign aid. An emergency audit was opened last night into revelations that poverty barons are making millions in consultancy free- fees from the foreign aid budgency. Uh, and yet more topless snaps, but Kate is dazzlingly defiant. And the sum, it's a Kate... Crime. It's a Kate crime. Oh, I see, like hate crime. I see what they've done there. It doesn't quite work. William begins criminal prosecution over snaps. 08459 four double five five double five. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about uh, this morning was exams. Uh, do you think exams are too easy these days? Some people do. And the government is going to announce today that the GCSE is to be abolished. After being in operation for more than a quarter of a century, it'll be. Re- I was one. Of, I was the second year to take GCSE exams. Uh, it'll be replaced by a new qualification similar to the old O level. Well, uh, what difference will it actually make? We can talk now to uh, our political correspondent Paul Rowley. Good morning, Paul. Morning, Ian. Why are they doing it, Paul? Because Michael Gove, the Education Secretary, says so, and he's in charge. So <laughs> it goes through. <laughs> uh, I mean, frankly, he thinks uh, the existing system is not much cop, which is a phrase I used in my English language O level. Uh, no wonder I didn't pass it. Are you old enough to do O level? To have done O levels, Paul? Uh, believe it or not, I did. Yes. I thought you were younger than me. No, no, no. Nine O levels, four A levels. Oh, 
And, uh, well, and, and I didn't go to university through choice. Well, I went you... straight into newspapers as a teenager. All right, stop. All right, Paul, stop showing off. I don't know if you're <laughs> looking for a wife or something. Uh, I've got one of them. What? Gr- <laughs> and, and, and two children who, funnily enough, are doing GCSEs, where oh. my eldest daughter is. Well, can I ask, what grades did you get for your four A-levels? For, four A-levels, two Bs and a C. Oh, uh, so- an, an A in, in general studies, which was... Oh, general studies, General studies, so great, wasn't it? Because you didn't, have to, you didn't have to research that one. So, so that was an easy one. So say four A-levels is impressive, two Bs and... Uh, a B and two Cs or whatever it was, it's not that great. <laughs> well, I, I only needed two A-levels to get onto my pre-entry journalist course, which exactly. allowed me doesn't, to then to go into newspapers. Doesn't that say Don't, a lot? And wait, I tell you what, I, I didn't miss it. I, I was three years ahead of all my contemporaries when, I, when they came into broadcast. I, I had the best three years of my life at university. Didn't set any exams, only wrote six essays. It was the greatest DOS ever. Anyway, and I back, paid for it, and I paid for thank it. Thank you, Paul. I'm very grateful. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a pint one day. <laughs> Listen, back to the story, for goodness sakes. We'll get in trouble. When do these new exams come in? Uh, in the autumn of 2015 is the intention. Okay. And as it's a two-year course, the first exams will be in the summer of 2017. But noticeably, hey, 2015 is election year, which oh. means that if Labour wins that election, they could be pulled if they if they go... They're not said yet what they're going to do about it. Uh, and I gather Michael Gove did want to bring it in the previous year, 2014. So it will be up and running by the time the voters went to the country. And thus, it would be hard to unpick. But I understand that Nick Clegg, for one, <laughs> got his way and said, look, it's going to cause too much uncertainty, not least for the pupils taking yeah. the exams, which are the ones that matter. Uh, the Liberal Democrats won another battle too, Ian, and that's the, the Tories wanted to return to a, another exam, a secondary exam, like the old CSE for less able pupils in my day. It was the ones that went to secondary modern schools. But yeah. uh, the coalition partners argued that would mean going back to what they saw as a two-tier system, so that's been dropped. Paul, it's interesting you said you've got two um, kids who, who, who are in the middle of doing their GCSEs, because the, one of the, the accusations has been from Michael Gove is that the GCSEs are too easy. I think that's really unfair. It's just different to the O levels because it, it's built up of coursework. Do you think, looking at it with your your kids, that it, they're too easy? I think the difficulty is always with the exam system. If you're if you've got a headache or whatever, you have a bad day and it's exam day and you don't do well, it's a bit unfair. Mm. And, and I can understand the coursework, which does go on all the time. Um, so you know, it's it, it, it's open to interpretation. I think the intention at the time was a understandable one, but that's always a problem in education, and it's always a problem in most things. All governments want to do things differently, and thus it does create uncertainty. Hence, that's one one of the problems they've had uh, with the uh, the health service. But I think the argument from the Conservatives is that we we are falling down in national standards. I think we've gone from 17th to 25th for reading, 24th to 28th for maths, and 16th to uh, 14th to 16th in science over three years. So that's they use those as their excuses Mm. or their explanations or their justification for it. I'm sure people will come up with different views on this one. It's all very hard. I'm glad I'm not at school, to be honest with you. Me too. Listen, very quickly, I I read this story yesterday. I think this is wonderful. That an education minister offered to resign during the recent government reshuffle, uh, and he's still there. What's going on? It's a guy called Jonathan Hill, who used to work for John Major, uh, but he's a Conservative peer these days. He's Lord Hill. uh, And he spent the last couple of years trying to get education bills through the House of Lords, often with great difficulty. And frankly, he's had enough. And he wanted to go back into business. So on the day that David Cameron was carrying out his reshuffle, he went to see the Prime Minister, told him of his intentions, but for some reason, David Cameron was distracted. <laughs> he didn't hear what he said. Instead, he, he praised uh, Jonathan Hill, thanked him for all his good work, and said, carry on, old chap, uh, and then rushed off because he, he was oh, late no. for a photo call. So it, it sounds incredibly implausible, Ian, especially when on that day another 30 ministers, uh, Cheryl Gillan included, lost their jobs, uh, and some of them didn't want to go. Uh, but it does sound as though it could have come from an episode of the political satire, wonderful. The Thick of It, which of course has returned to BBC Two in recent weeks. If you saw this week's episode, Malcolm Tucker returned and we heard about the quiet bat people. <laughs> I missed it. I have it on my Sky Plus. Paul, thank you very much. Best of luck to your two girls uh, uh, doing their, their exams. Paul Rowley there. It's, an ama- it's a brilliant story. Lord Hill. He goes, imagine this, you go into you, you, to resign and it's, you, it's, it's quite a nerve-wracking thing, I'd imagine, going in to do that. Well, I know it is. You go in to resign, <clears throat> and you kind of put forward why you've enjoyed your time there, and it, it's time to move on, and you want to have a look at and, and, and expand and do other things. And your boss, the Prime Minister in this case, isn't listening, looks up, says, yeah, well, no, good work, excellent, carry on, really enjoying your stuff, moustache, bye, and runs off. How embarrassing is that? And even more embarrassing, that it's now out in the public domain, that people are aware of this. 
Oh, dearie me. We had there, Paul uh, Rowley, our political correspondent, talking about exams. Do you think exams are too easy these days? I sat the GCSEs. I don't think they are easy. I'm not very good at exams. I haven't got an exam head. I can't get my head to work in the, that, that way. But what do you think? 08459 four double five five double five, Or text 81333. Start your text 3CR. Coming up on the show, more about first aid, your views on exams. Oh, and we've got our two experts to talk about Strictly Come Dancing. Kicked off at the weekend. Should be fun. All of that after the news with Catherine Boyle. Listen, this is Ian Lee. It's BBC Three Counties Radio. It's three minutes past seven. Now, up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped save their lives, according to St John Ambulance. I'm asking, when has first aid helped you? And do you think that you're well enough equipped to help somebody? 08459 455 555. We'll also be talking uh, about Strictly Come Dancing. And the government will announce today the end of the GCSEs. Do you think that exams today are too easy? Uh, You can tweet us at 3CR, at BBC 3CR, or you can give us a call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, back to that first aid uh, story. Up to 140,000 people are dying each year uh, when first aid could have helped to save their lives. That's according to St John Ambulance. The charity says... This is, the, this is incredible if this is true. Why would they lie? The charity says this is the same number that die from cancer and have launched a campaign uh, which started airing last night to encourage more people to learn the basic skills. Joining me in the studio now is Regional Director of St John, Mark Farmer. Morning, Mark. Morning. And it's, it's St John, not St John's. That's correct. Yeah, it's St John Ambulance. I've, I've had my knuckles wrapped several times by the team this morning for getting it wrong the advert was uh, premiered last night uh, during downton abbey what do you make of it i think it's a very powerful message and the the idea is to get the message across that as people who saw the advert will realize that there's a large number of people that could potentially be saved it's, it's an amazing coincidence if you like or juxtaposition of facts it's a similar number that die of cancer but the point is people don't need to feel helpless in first aid situations mm. simple skills can save lives do you think the advert's going to work? We were saying off air that it's, it's had a lot of press. You're in here, you're off to do other mm-hmm. press today, it's in some of the papers. Are people actually going to sit up and take notice and say, well, do you, do you know what, maybe I should go and do a little first aid course? I think it will definitely uh, make, make a difference. Yep. I think people, um, the fact they're talking about it today, as mm. you say, and I think it will generate more um, information and um, um, excitement, if you like, that's the right word, as we go through the week. But it's about interest. It's about getting people engaged with mm. the fact that simple skills, it's nothing difficult, they can, you know... Um, on course they want to but they can simply download an app they can download our first aid guide it's very simple skills can make i was going to say listen i'm a very very busy man i haven't got time to go to a course but you said you said there's an app that you can that you can get what does that do yes there is on that on the st john website there's um, an app for iphones and similar and it's just a very simple step-by-step guide and actually if you did nothing else and you had that on your phone and you came across something like a choking incident or somebody bleeding it would give you enough to feel confident to do something. And that's really? what it's that's a- incredible. Yeah, and that's what it's about. It's about not feeling helpless and um, it's about having just that little bit of confidence to be able to do something that could, could make the difference. What sort of deaths could be avoided through having a bit of simple first aid knowledge? The um, free guide and the app cover um, choking, yeah. they cover bleeding. They cover being unconscious and they cover not breathing. So right. The main areas that people can make a difference on. And as I say, it's not big, it's not difficult skills, it's not lots of knowledge, it is that little bit of difference. The, the, the advice changes, doesn't it? Because I think, is the Heimlich out of fashion these days? Because now it's, it's, it's a swift palm of the, the, the palm onto the back, isn't it? That's right. And I'm, I'm, like, like all areas of medicine, if, if, if you like, um, as, as more knowledge comes, things, things change. But actually, people have got uh, older skills, they should still use them rather than do right. nothing. Okay. I saved my mum with the Heimlich manoeuvre. It was, it was incredible. She was choking and we were laughing about it, as you often mm-hmm. do. And then I could see that the laughter was turning to fear and she yep. went blue. She had a bit of, and I, I, it's quite an amazing thing to actually do that and feel the air come out as, as she kind of started breathing. Again. Yeah, that's incredible. right. So, so you made that difference. Yep. And, you know, the surveys we've been doing is it's amazing how few people know that. Mm. Um, and the, most, the local one to hear was Milton Keynes. It's sort of less than one in six people felt they would know enough to be able to do anything at all. Well, if you stand around and do nothing, you could, you know, that, that, that life could be lost. Isn't there a fear in this kind of litigious culture that some people, I know uh, this is true in America, I don't know if it's true over here, Mm -hmm. that some people are afraid to do first aid in case they do something wrong and worsen the situation and get sued? 
I think that concern is there, but it's misplaced. We've not right. come across any evidence of anybody being successfully sued where they've acted on advice, even if it is just written advice. Um, so I think that um, understandable concern, mm. but I think it's, um, it's misplaced and, and actually people need to get that little bit of skill and feel confident to put things forward. And if I can just say, if they, the, the, the guide is available by texting HELP to 80039. 80039, text yep. the word And that will okay. give them a free, uh, we'll send the free pocket first aid guide or the St John website, www.sja.org. UK and they'll find the app. I tell you what's nice is seeing St John Ambulance being a bit proactive because we're used to going to fates mm-hmm. and do's in village halls and there's always a little volunteer sat on a chair in the corner and it's good to see uh, you kind of being a bit bigger and a bit louder. Is this, is this a conscious plan of yours to make yourselves more publicly available? Um, yeah, we're a significant national charity. Mm. As you say, people think of us at fates or alongside football matches um, or they may have used us in the workplace for a training course. And we train sort of 250,000 people a year in the workplace as, as well as in schools. But, but the key, key thing we're there about is saying we can save lives mm. and actually we, we can all save lives together and that's really what has to be the most important thing. Is there one thing, you, I know you've got to go in a second so I shall let you get on. <laughs> is there one thing that you could sh- tell me now or show me now that, that could, could help in an incident? I know I put you on the spot. Be any number. <laughs> okay, supposing someone's got a really bad gash on their yep. arm and blood is pouring out, what should I do? Apply pressure straight away so on um, the, yeah, on the a, a lot, apply direct pressure you can use a credit card we've got examples of people actually saving lives by getting a credit card out pressing that credit card into the wound wow. stopping the bleeding that's that that does it that that is enough knowledge to possibly save that life fantastic well there you go we've learned something thank you so much for coming in i shall let you go because i know you've got a busy day <laughs> and good luck promoting all of this thanks very much uh, i should certainly be downloading uh, the app a little bit later on that's uh, mark farmer who is the regional director of st john ambulance well, there you go. We've, we've learned something this morning, haven't we? That's got to be good. How do you... V- do you think that if you came across a first aid emergency, that you could do... You would have enough knowledge to do what you needed to do? We know there, if, if, uh, if you, someone cuts themselves, you push down hard on their gash with uh, a credit card, and that will stop the flow of blood. There we go. We've learned something. That's one positive thing we've got today. The Heimlich manoeuvre, it's a little bit out of fashion, but it still works. Otherwise, the, the, the heel of the palm, five swift hits between the, 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 the spine. The, the, not the spine, the um, shoulder blades. Well, do you know what to do? 08459 455 555. It's weird, isn't it? It's one of those things that, that, that we should all know. Maybe they should make this compulsory in schools. There was like a little module, I remember, do first aid, and it was kind of, uh, not really... The girls would go and do it. But maybe it would be more pertinent to make it compulsory at schools. Nick in Hitchin has texted in regarding first aid. Uh, 81333. Start your text. Uh, 3CR. Um, some time ago, I was having a meal in a restaurant just outside Hitchin. What you've done there, Nick, is you have, uh, you've, you've painted the picture. We can imagine you in there now. And got a piece of steak stuck in my throat and I couldn't breathe. <clears throat> Another diner saw what was happening and gave me the Heimlich manoeuvre. I made sure I thanked him. I should hope you did. He saved your life. Of course you would. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do in most situations. The, the, the only thing I would know to do is call 999 uh, and get an ambulance there. And I've done that, I've done that many times. 08459 455 555. Have you ever had cause to use first aid or been in a situation when you wished you knew what to do? And how would you have gone about doing that? Uh, you can text 81333. We had uh, a gentleman in who's got uh, a, a stall. Uh, that sells Nazi memorabilia, amongst other things. That's not the only thing that he sells, but he's got other bits and pieces. And uh, I was asking... It it was incredible. Some of the stuff he had was incredible. Uh, And there's obviously an historical interest. Uh, But I was asking, is it appropriate to sell this kind of stuff? Really, it did make me feel uncomfortable looking at it and touching it. Uh, and Dave, the, uh, the thatch, says, Did you know that up until World War Two, an RAF squadron used a, sw- a swastika as its emblem? Finland also used the symbol, as did native Indians in the USA. Yeah, load, it's, a, it's an ancient Indian uh, religious symbol as well. You go to Japan, I go to Japan, I've been to Japan a few times, one of my favourite countries in the world, uh, and uh, loads of their stuff, I remember being in a market stall, and just the bag that we bought some donuts in had swastikas on. They were I- inverted swastikas. And my wife couldn't believe it. But it's, you know, it's, it's a religious symbol. I think it's a, um, a Zen thing as well. Not Zen, Shinto. Anyway, right, let's go a quick look at the newspaper, shall we? I think that would be appropriate <laughs> to do at this time of the morning. Oh, dear. You know that feeling on Mondays? When you, you, you kind of still wish it was Sundays, you know that feeling? That's, that's what I've got. 
That's all I've got now. Coming up, we'll be talking about uh, Strictly Come Dancing as well with our two experts, which I'm very excited about, our two uh, under-10 experts. Uh, the Independent. Uh, everyone's banging on about Downton. It's on the front pages of a lot of the newspapers. I, 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 uh, I've never seen it. I'll never see it. But it's everywhere. The Independent. The front page is a picture of Andy Murray having his face licked by a dog. I know. The world has gone mad. Uh, and they also... Uh, another story. Uh, children in peril as women are jailed in record numbers. The number of women in prisons has more than doubled in 15 years. Um, don't do naughty things, I guess, is the, the message there. Don't, don't break the law. The Daily Telegraph. Uh, IVF babies with three parents. Controversial fertility treatment to eliminate a range of hereditary diseases could be made legal next year. Britain be- could become the first country in the world to uh, legalise the creation of babies with three biological parents. Ah? Uh? Ah? Uh? Um, a rushed, oh, the Salman Rushdie fatwa is back on with the £2 million bounty. An Iranian, an Iranian religious foundation has resurrected the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Really? Uh, the Times, handover is put at risk by attacks from within. The credibility of Britain and America's handover plan for Afghanistan is under threat after the worst spate of insider attacks. Uh, the Guardian, starting gun for England's badger shoot. First licence expected in cull that could wipe out a third of the population. We'll do the rest of the papers in a little bit. 7.15 on Monday, the 17th of September. These are the headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. St John Ambulance say almost 140,000 people die every year in situations where first aid could have helped save their lives. Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will go to court in Paris today to try to restrict the publication of pictures showing the Duchess sunbathing topless. In sport, England's cricketers are continuing their preparations ahead of their defence of the 2020 World Cup with a warm-up match against Australia in Colombo. Sorry, I I had a picture of (laughs) Colombo in my head. The detective, not the place. How silly of me. We'll have a full weather bulletin in a moment with Chris Bell. Coming up, Rhythms of the World, one of the most important festivals of world music in the three counties. However, it's been kicked out of its usual home at Hitchin Priory. We'll find out more about that very soon. BBC Three Counties Radio. We got uh, an email on GCSEs. What would be great is if we could get someone on who is, uh, has just taken or is currently taking their GCSEs and uh, an old school old O level person. Can we get that? Oh <clears throat> eight four five nine, four double five five double five. Sue uh, has emailed in. I'm a secondary teacher and despair at the year seven students who come up barely able to read and write. It's not the 16 plus exams that need an overhaul, but the primary schools that need a change. They are underfunded and need more money to spend on literacy and numeracy, especially for those children who live in a home where their primary language is not English and have little help with learning how to read with parents. It does strike me as amazing that more parents don't read to their kids. My little boy, two and a half, loves sitting in a corner reading. Last night... Um, he, he, he wanted to watch a bit of Postman Pat, which I must admit, I'm really getting into Postman Pat at the moment. It's awesome. Right? And anyone who disses Postman Pat is a Muppet. Right? I was enjoying And I said, oh, should we watch some Postman Pat? Oh, no, Daddy, could you read me some stories? And I was the one sort of pressurising him to watch a bit of TV. I was going, well, Postman Pat, I've got some good ones taped that we've not seen yet. Oh, I'd really like some stories. We had to read stories. And at two, he's two years, eight months. He can read some letters. He can't read words yet. He can't put the letters together. But he can read letters, and he knows the Greek alphabet. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very posh. 08459 455 555. On the subject of first aid, Joyce is in Leegrave. Good morning, Joyce. Oh, good morning. Joyce, uh, w- what's your take on this? Yes, I do believe that children should be tortured at school at the right age, obviously. Yes. And the thing being, uh, their, their siblings, their children, or their brothers or sisters, they'll they watch their, their elder children. Mm sort of, and they were copy, and they'll have some idea anyway, till they can learn. But the thing being, I went years ago, my husband had a, had a heart problem, mm. and um, I thought, I'm never going to see him on the floor in front of me, and I can't do anything, yeah. you know? So, and I did go to Salvation Army, as it was then, at Park Square, uh, and I did go for the course for the St. John's Ambulance regarding starting up the heart again. That's all it was, actually. Yes. And, uh, it was such a wonderful experience. It's a bit worrying when you're doing it, but it was such a wonderful experience in seeing that imitation chest 
<clears throat> start to rise again. Yes. And pump through the heart, and it was wonderful. And uh, the other occasion, which... Um, Joyce, I... you have to be quite aggressive on that <laughs> dummy, don't you? Did you enjoy that? Oh, you do, because I yes. didn't think, I'm never going to do it. He's not going to live. He's not going to live, you know. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And, and to be quite honest, when it did start to come, I, f- I felt I could have... Whoopee! You know, I could have <laughs> saved it. We him. have to stress, this is, this is the dummy that you saved. <laughs> this is, did, did you ever have to use it on your husband at all? <laughs> Thank goodness, no. There you go. But I must tell you this one quick thing. Yeah. Um, my mum lived in Cuffey Close, which is on the Marsh Road. Um, that comes out onto the main road there. Traffic jam one morning. I, I was walking onto the main road there, and there was a traffic jam. Yes. And cars were hooting at the back, and we were looking around. And we could see this um, person, a man it was, slumped over the wheel. Oh, dear. Uh, yes, that's what we thought. And consequently, that flashed in my mind what we did at St. John's, mm. and the thing being, the, the driver behind him, he, I went like this, something's wrong, because he was tooting, I thought, you, you know, was, be quiet. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, he, uh, he did come out, he opened the door, yes. and he must have had some first aid as well, because the first thing we had to do, test his pulse on the neck before we moved him. Yes. And he opened the door, and get him out very gently, took him to the pavement, Put him in a recovery position. Did he live, Joyce? Yes, he did. There we go. That's what we... Thank you for... Sorry to, to, to rush you, but we've got so much to, to cram up. Joyce there, who um, managed to bring a dummy back to life and was very excited. But she knows it. She knows how to do these things now. She could do it if she had to. I couldn't. 08459 four double five five double five. Ah, You can give us a call at any time this morning. 08459 four double five five double five. Now, Rhythms of the World, one of the most important festivals of world music in the three counties, has been kicked out of its usual home at Hitchin Priory. Chartridge Conference Company, who own the site, are no longer uh, to uh, hold festivals in the grounds for business reasons. Hilary Robertson is spokesperson for Rhythms of the World. She's in the studio this morning. Good morning, Hilary. Good morning, Ian. And I see uh, from Twitter that it's a little bit too early for you. Just a little. Little, yes. <laughs> You're looking very glamorous at this ridiculous Thank time you. of day. Well, for, for those who don't know, and I've not been because I've only just kind of joined here, but I'm aware of it, what exactly is Rhythms of the World? Rhythms of the World is an amazing festival. I was involved in it as a performer before I was involved in the organising of it. Um, and it, um, we have about 140 acts every year, mm. up to 30,000 people come into the audience, um, seven stages. It's been, for a while it was in the town centre. Yep. And then in in 2007, the powers that be decided that that was too, that was unmanageable. Yes. And we were, well, we, at the time, the Rhythms of the World organisation was extremely grateful because Chartridge, the Priory, rocked up and they just went, do you know what? We've got these grounds do it here and it meant that it was enclosed it meant that it was much more controllable yeah. it meant that people could come you know it was ticketed and it we was still i mean it's only 10 quid this year i mean that's incredible to see people like the damned juju some you selling bands. it you're working no it. but it's just an amazing <laughs> yeah, amazing yeah. thing and i tell um, there is good value for money to yeah. the love luton festival <laughs> well <laughs> yeah a lot of things are a lot more yeah. a lot more money than that and um so the priory stepped in in uh, for the 2008 festival so for five years They've given up, and, it, and it's not just obviously not just the weekend of the festival itself. Yeah. They do the week before when they're set up, the week after when it's you know taking everything out. Um, so they've been amazing for five years, and to be honest, that's as much as you would have expected from anybody, you know, because they're, they're a business; yeah. they're, not, they're not part of the organisation. So. Um, we had a terrible year this year with the rain. Mm. It was incredible on Saturday. Of course, um, it, was, it was during the rainy season, oh, wasn't it? Was it was yes. so... Well, it was one of the worst yep. summers we've ever... Oh, was summer, in inverted commas. Yes, with a very small S. Yes. So it's been terrible. It was terrible. And um, the mud was amazing. But there were still thousands and thousands of people who had such a good time. Yeah. Um, we have 800 volunteers. 800 people give up their time. And for some of us, that's now i mean throughout the year i yeah. give up my time for for rhythms for other people it's just a couple a few hours on the day over the weekend some for some people it's the week before and the week after you know everybody gives what they can mm. um so 800 people that's a, you know it's an amazing thing um and so we just we're in the situation now where the trustees are going to meet and decide what next and it's quite exciting i actually think it's quite an exciting time oh really hang on you're, yeah. you're, you're excited that you've been booted yeah. off of your well, land booted off is slightly unkind what did the priory say how have they kind of it, explained it, it to you? it's a business decision right um they had um there was a lot of kind of fallout of the because the the 
the ground was completely torn up by the rain and then thousands and thousands of people walking on it, turning it to yes, a mud bath. that would do it. Yeah. And although right in front of the... the have you been to the Priory? Do you know, I'm aware do you know, of it, yeah. OK, yeah. it's beautiful, beautiful yeah. grounds. And although in front of it, that wasn't too bad. The actual lawn in front of it wasn't too bad. The bit sort of the other side was, was just a mud bath. And um, I can quite understand that they've turned around and gone, do you know what, in the summer we want people to have weddings here. You know, right. it's not very nice to have your wedding photos with a mud pit. So that's that's the main reason, the mud. The, the, um, the fact that the, the yeah, I got... think so. That's that, that that's right. certainly their their sort of explanation. But it's a business decision. I mean, you yeah. know, who's ever party to, to the the rationale behind these things? Um, but it's certainly uh, for business reasons. So what are you going to do now? Have you have you got any inklings of where you want to go? No. Well. I mean, that's the night. Nice, I mean, honestly, oh, genuinely, I, this is so exciting. Don't, don't spin on this for me. It's, it must not, be terrifying. It is, but in a, it doesn't doesn't terrifying give you some good feelings sometimes? It's, it's a not good very thing. Often. Well, okay, <laughs> but I think it's I, um, you know who knows where it's going to be. Yeah. There are there are people who are going right. Take it back into the streets of Hitchin, which and it was incredible then, but it just got so busy. Too big, it was, isn't it? Yeah, and it was it was so popular. I mean, that's we were almost spoiled by our popularity really yeah. in the town, but. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, there are people who are going, well, it has to stay in Hitchin. And there are people saying, well, no, it doesn't have to stay in Hitchin. It could go somewhere else. So the, it's nice for the trustees who, well, they have to make the decision. I don't. But, you know, of, of where it goes next. I mean, you And know. are they talking to people? Are there, there, there are places... Well, that... literally, this has just happened right. in the last couple of days. But there are certainly places being talked about. There are people being talked to. There are There are ideas up in the air so, so basically if anyone's got a field or a big back garden <laughs> that they don't want for a weekend absolutely they don't mind again yeah. now bbc three counties there every year oh i know and, and actually i have to say yeah. genuinely the support of three counties radio has been amazing we had nick coffer down there on saturday i can only apologize for that uh, he was brilliant <laughs> he tasted all the food of course was, he did yeah, yeah he's exactly. the best job in the world he i know eat everything absolutely yeah. you're the most enthusiastic person i've ever met i'm sorry <laughs> no, i'm sorry it's very po- early <laughs> <laughs> I, is the festival done definitely going to happen next year uh i want I, a yes or no answer okay, now no i can't say that definitely okay but i can say that rhythms of the well actually rhythms of the world presents is happening on the 23rd of october we right. we do a lot of things with young local bands and on the 23rd of october we're opening club 85 for a rhythms of the world event mm. so we call it rhythms of the world presents because it's not the actual july weekend right. but it's all about local bands giving them an opportunity to perform perform in front of people mm. which is where i started you yeah. know i was a sax player when i was 16 and you know if i hadn't had the opportunities that i was given to perform locally i wouldn't have then been able to play in front of you know loads and loads of yeah people it's things like that are important we've got, we got a statement from uh, Hitchin Priory. Barry Wilson um, says, we're very proud to have supported Rhythms of the World for so many years. Providing the venue for such an amazing community festival has been a huge undertaking. However, we've taken the difficult business decision not to hold any festivals at Hitchin Priory. Uh, exactly. So it's all, it's, it's all amenable and, you, you know... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's no... Yeah. We're not... You know, you use the expression booted out. I, I think that's slightly <laughs> unkind. You politely asked to leave. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> you so. escorted off the premises. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, I, I'm sure you, you will find somewhere. L- let us know how it goes. Of course. Of course, well, well I think part. I think honestly, BBC Three Counties and your audiences will be the first to know. Nick Nick was Nick Coffer was gutted. He's thinking, well, I'm, where am I going to get free food? For Absolutely, <laughs> Hilary. Thank you very much, Hilary uh, Robertson, spokesperson for Rhythms of the World. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. <laughs> Hilary Robertson, with the most enthusiastic person I've I've ever met. I'm, I, it's hard to encounter that much enthusiasm and positivity at twenty past seven on a Monday morning, but it's rubbed off on me a little bit. I'm feeling quite good. Uh, let's get the latest news and sport now with Catherine Boyle. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning! Now, on Friday, uh, we told you about 300 students gathering in Luton to try and break the world's largest game jam in a single location. Luton student Jean-Christophe Mazza uh, captains the world record attempt. He's back in the studio. I've got to be honest, Jean-Christophe, you're looking a lot more tired than you were on Friday morning. I'm exhausted. (laughs) I'm really exhausted. (laughs) So, did you you break the world record? We did, actually. There was already a world record from before. There was, we had to be 294 students. I think right. so. We were 299. There so. we go. Oh, hang on, it's supposed to be 300. Did, did someone drop out at the last minute? Yeah, I think there have been a few people that Jeez. dropped out, but we Jeez. still got the record anyway. I know some unreliable people, but <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> but games programmers and geeks are normally bang on. T- <laughs> just remind people who weren't listening on Friday what exactly is a game jam? Well, basically, we just 
gather all together. We have different teams and they give us a theme. Yeah. And we just have to make a game based on that theme within 48 hours. And what was the theme? Uh, Pride of London. It's okay. a bit... <laughs> we didn't like the theme, really, because it just... <laughs> I mean, pride of London. If it was just London, then we would yeah. have thought, yeah, we just try and blow up buildings and things like that. But well, they went pride of London, yes. so they just went something positive and p- something to do with London. Okay. Really, so. Okay. Uh, and so, how does it work? You're all in different teams. Yeah. Are you all contributing to the same game, or you're all making different games? We're all making different game, but it just have to be the same theme for right. every now, game. Now you've got the game here. Yeah, that's right. It's on. It's on this computer. I'm going to. I'm clicking on this 20 yeah. game, 2D yeah, game yeah, engine. The mouse is in the middle. Of oh, look at this. Yeah. This is uh, the, the tiniest. Yeah. Am I doing it? Uh, just go on to there and then click uh the there's a mouse click on the I bottom can't even of work the, keyboard. the blooming computer how am i going to play <laughs> the game we're in okay uh, all you have to do is just press the space bar and okay. the character's running through buildings so it's a dude running across buildings and uh, i'm going to press space and he's jumping, jumping up there over, trying to collect coins and oh i see to... i see there are coins so it's yeah. it's kind of like a cross you you you're probably too young to remember yeah oh i'm going <laughs> to die hang on whoa and i've just fallen down Game it. over. <laughs> You're probably too young to remember the game Hunchback. Do you remember that? Oh, I know. Oh, all right, really. calm down. I know I'm an old man, <laughs> but blimey. Uh, Hunchback was basically the Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh-huh. and you would run along and you would jump and stuff. So it's, it's sort of a bit of that. Yeah, it's, that's what it is, really. And it's just you have to jump at the right time and try not to fall over and try and beat your score to the furthest you can reach. What happens with this game now? Does this go anywhere? Can people get it? Nah, it won't go anywhere, really. Oh, man, but we really? got we got a chance to... We can just further develop in it because it needs a lot of work anyway. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we could, like, get... We can I still got contact with my team members and yeah. we can still work on it and then possibly in the future you we can, can that publish that an app it. or something, a little downloadable app, couldn't you or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we could definitely do. But it needs a lot of cleaning first okay. and once we've done that, then we could publish it. That's no problem. And you're a world record holder now. So we're a world record holder. Does it feel good? Right very good. Yeah? Very good. Are you going to be in the Guinness Book of Records? Uh, we are, yeah. Okay. I th- I th- you're, you're French, aren't you? Yeah, I, I am. I think it's great that a Frenchman was given the title Pride of London. <laughs> Stop taking pictures of our princess! <laughs> John Christophe, very nice to see you again. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's, I, I cannot tell you how nice it is to have some geeks in the studio. It makes me feel at home. We, <laughs> I know, we, I we know. We speak the same language. <laughs> John Christophe <laughs> Mazza there, who is now a world record holder um, as part of the team that broke the uh, world record for the Game Jam. Now, a business owner in Dunstable said trade is down nearly 40% because of roadworks in the town. Traffic is being diverted away from his shop while the work is completed. Our reporter, Gareth Lloyd, is in Dunstable this morning. Morning, Gareth. Morning, Ian. I shouldn't have had that pickled egg this morning. Oh, it's returning on me. But, bring uh, one back for me. I uh, love a pickled egg. I promise you I'll bring, Good I'll lad, bring, thank I'll bring you. the pickled egg back. No, I, I'm at uh, Mike's chip shop here in the, uh, in the in Dunstable town centre. Uh, Mike, whereabouts are we? The, 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 the area that people might know from the, the old Queensway Hall, the, the now the new supermarket, the theatre area. We're on the back of that, aren't we? Yes, we're right in front of the um, as uh, in front of one of the great superstores in, in Dunstable, and we've got the car parts right in front of us here, and the library to our right. How long has the chip shop been here for? Exactly three years and a week, so <laughs> we're brand new. Happy birthday! Happy birthday to us. But at the moment, uh, the views outside, I can't really see the uh, the, the, the buildings ahead because it's uh, it's roadworks uh, roadworks city here at the moment. What's actually happening? Um, we're having a new busway put in, t- uh, bus lanes put into the Dunstable area, and we're right in the middle of this. We've had the roadworks in front of us now since the beginning of uh, July, and we're expecting to stay until November, possibly longer. Now, you're saying it's, it's, uh, the roadworks have affected uh, trade and business here, though? Businesses here have been affected very, very badly. Um, this is mainly due to the fact that we believe that the one-way system has actually been put the wrong way and taking customers out of the area instead of bringing them into the area. Let's step outside the uh, front of the, the chip shop onto the, onto the street. So at the moment I can see the library and the, the old council buildings there. Uh, they've turned this whole area into a one-way system. So to, to get to the supermarket, to get to the theatre and to your shop, you have to go, if you're on High Street North, you've got to go through the centre of Dunstable, turn left uh, towards Luton, but then at the, the burnt-out Norman King turn in, and that's the start of the one-way system? That is the start of the one-way system, although we actually believe the one-way system starts um, not so much as the Norman King, but actually on North Street, because you can only turn, turn left, you're in a busy uh, main road there, so you're bringing traffic from a minor road and putting them onto a major road and then taking them out. And it is, 
It is a long drive. Affecting trade nearly 40%. Your profits are, are really that down? It's not the profits that are down. The, the profits are down by more than that because we sell fish and chips. Uh, we have a great amount of wastage now. Frozen fish just not, does not keep, and so we have lose a lot more. You speak to? Do you speak to other uh, shopkeepers? I mean, I know Dunstable is is, is, is going through a bit of a, uh, a fight over the last few years. We're trying to I- improve the image and get shopkeepers to take up the units in the town centre. Do you speak to other shopkeepers? Are they having the same problem because of these roadworks? Let's wander back in the shop. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to drive past there. Are you, are you speaking to other shopkeepers? I'm quite lucky. Um, I know quite a few of the other shopkeepers, and I speak to a few of them almost every day. Um, it seems to be not just myself, although I'm stuck right inside the roadworks itself, but it's the whole town that is suffering here. Um, we, we know that uh, business is harder this time, but with these extra roadworks here, it's actually killing us off. But the, 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 the road around here, the junction going out onto High Street North, it's never really worked. It's never been a great uh, drive or a, a, a flowing through traffic, is it? Uh, no, this, the, you're, you're, bringing, uh, you're bringing everything into a bottleneck there and then trying to turn left and right, and the traffic lights do not work there at all. I, is, there a, uh, is there a better way to be doing this, do you think? I believe there is a better way. If you brought the traffic off the main road and brought them into us, yes, the car park in front of me that you can see, this would make a perfect place to park the cars, and then they'd opened up just behind the uh, library, and they could have actually come out there. We understand they would have had to put a one-way system in the Queensway uh, for about a two-week period, but not for a 20-week period. Just finally, the... uh you're talking about your your sales down your your footfall down Uh, the roadworks we hope will finish before christmas you you can survive till then have you heard can other shops survive till this is is it affecting you that badly it is affecting us this badly Uh, my next door neighbor believes that he could be going out by christmas um there's a card shop um i do know it's actually thinking of going down there's a large sweet shop or a small sweet shop which started up two years ago these all new businesses which are going down it's also the established ones. Um, there's a, a closed shop just across the road from where I am. They're also in trouble, and this could affect a number of people. Uh, the council are trying to do what they can for us, but as this is not run by the town council, there's not a lot they can do. And I guess that's the question, Ian, this morning. Do we need this bus lane if it's affecting uh, the shops and the people who are trying to put into Dunstable as much as possible, a, a very suffering Dunstable as it is? Is this bus lane really worth it if the, the shops are struggling and may not even see it through till Christmas? It's a tough one, isn't it, Gareth? But um, listen, thank you very much for that report, and I'm serious, I do want a pickled egg. But what about the gherkins or the onions? I'm not a fan of the pickled onions, to be honest. It's, it's all about the eggs for me. Uh, get you an egg, I'll bring thank one back. Thank you very much, there we go. It's, it, it, it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? But support your local chip shops, kids. Seriously, support, I'm having chips tonight, I've decided. Support your local chip shops. Ah, dear. Now, the chairman of Stevenage FC says he's considering building a new stadium for the club and is in discussion with owners of a possible new site. Phil Wallace told BBC Three Counties Radio that a new stadium is a possibility and they, had, they have potential sites in mind. We're just looking at where we go now and what we're doing and um, the big decision is new new stand or a new stadium. You're actually c- contemplating that that could be a possibility, a new ground? Yeah, you've got to plan ahead. And um, if you don't plan ahead, you, it, it, won't, it will come back and uh, bite you in the backside. So I'm looking, you know, whether that's two years, three years, five years, I don't know. Um, if our crowds go up, um, then it might make a case for a new stadium. An expanding area, there probably are possible sites readily available to yourselves. Yeah, the sites are not a problem, and we've identified uh, one and, and been in discussions with one already. Um, but it's really about uh, making sure we drive the crowds up before we take that next step. That's Phil Wallace uh, of Stevenage FC talking to our reporter Ewan Duncan. Well, Lloyd Briscoe is chair of Stevenage FC Supporters Club. He's on the line. Morning, Lloyd. Good morning. Well, how much do fans know about this? Uh, nothing. Uh, the first time I heard about it was uh, was Phil's interview, so uh, he's kept this one close to his chest, hasn't he? <laughs> it, d- d- I'm, so I'm guessing you're quite surprised by this. How do you feel about it? Well, as, as he quite rightly said in his interview, um, the stadium uh, is in need of some, some TLC. Um, it's, it's, it's a council-owned asset, so the club pays a rent to it, and the club's recently shelled out half a million pounds on, on, on doing up the, the new main stand. 
So uh, I think the, the cause is uh, that we need to get more bums on seats in Steamish to make the, uh, the project viable. Uh, you, you say that there's been money spent on, on doing up a new stand. What would you prefer, a new stadium or a completely new stand? I'm traditionalist. <laughs> I'd prefer to stay in Broad Hall Way if we possibly could because, uh, you know, we've been there since 1963 and the town's got history and heritage behind it. So uh, my preference would be to stay where we are. Uh, how well can the stadium cope with League One football, though? Well, with League One, it's OK because uh, we're only maintaining uh, a core attendance of Stevenage supporters, about uh, three, three and a half thousand, I guess, if that. So uh, currently we're doing OK. If we were to get promoted to the Championship, that would be different. Uh, we'd get much bigger attendances, I'm sure, and I think that's what's behind Phil Wallace's logic. How likely is it that you are going to get promoted? Well, hey... <laughs> uh, be honest, Lloyd, come on! Well, we're third at the moment, so uh, this is a brand new team being put together. Yeah. And personally, I'm very impressed by what, uh, uh, by what I see on, on the pitch. You know, Gary Smith's done a fantastic job so far. Uh, we've met to meet a few of the big boys, but when we went up to Coventry the other day and, and beat them 2-1, you know, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So there's no reason at all why we can't be in the playoffs this year. Lloyd, listen, thank you very much. Uh, Lloyd Briscoe is the chair of Stevenage FC Supporters Club. Let us know what you think. You can text 81333, start your text 3CR, or you can tweet us at BBC3CR. Good morning, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. It's 7.46, and these are your headlines on Monday the 17th of September. Up to 140,000 people die every year when first aid could have helped to save their lives, according to a new campaign from St John Ambulance. Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are going to a French court later today to seek an injunction against the magazine that published topless shots of the Duchess. In sport, England's cricketers are continuing their preparations ahead of their defence of the 2020 World Cup, with a warm-up match against Australia in Colombo. Your weather today for the three counties, mainly dry with sunny spells, top temperature 19 degrees, and coming up after 8am we'll be joined by a first aid trainer for Active Luton, who is going to be teaching me some first aid. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, dear listener. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Uh, lots to talk about, including are exams too easy these days? And have you ever had cause to use first aid? And uh, well, I will be learning some first aid later on today. And I'll be practising on our work experience boy, Ollie. I don't know if Ollie knows that yet, but that's what's going to be happening. Now, expansion plans for Luton Airport, which will see passenger numbers go from 10 to 18 million a year, could be a step closer. The airport's owners and operators have reached an agreement with EasyJet over the plans and will submit a full planning application after a public consultation later on in the year. These passengers gave their reactions to the plans. As long as there's space for it, at the end of the day, is there, is there room for it? I mean, I've, I've been come down here for 16 years and I've seen a huge difference in Luton Airport. I mean, it's, it's a lot better than it was. It used to be really bad. To get, um, but it could be better. Oh, yeah, it could yeah. be better, yeah. A lot better, yeah. What sort of things would you like to see improved? Car parking. <laughs> That's the main problem. Access? Access, yeah, coming on that road every morning, it's chock block and going out it's chock block as well. So, yeah, definitely those two main ones. Well, I think they're thinking about improving that sort of yeah. thing. Sooner the better, I think. Well, if, it, if it's so more people can travel easier, yes... If it's just purely for money, I think, um, I'm not sure. What about the people in the area? Will they be affected? You know, uh, that's the thing. I, I think I'd be sad if it was too big. <laughs> so you'd like to see it sort of kept roughly at this size, do you think, manageable? Yes, I would, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just at this size is great, yeah. Unless I want to fly to America. Yeah. yeah. If you're not going to do that, then just keep it as this boy. A lot of people come, you know, uh, here, obviously, and uh, you've got a single lane coming in and out. Sometimes you're backed up all the way down to the roundabouts and stuff. So, uh, obviously, if they improve the access, it would be a lot better. It's, good, it's the local airport for me, so I'd like to have more routes out of here. What about the access? Because it can be a bit tricky at times. Do you like to see that improve? Uh, yes, it can get rather busy in the morning. Um, that it, it gets a bit congested, that particular area. Yeah. So, if they improve that, that would be good? Yeah, definitely. Well, John Davis is from Ladakan, the Luton and District Association for the Control of Airport Noise. He joins me in the studio now. John, you heard those passengers. Most of them seem to be in favour of the expansion. With all due respect, not most of them. I thought the most telling one was the person who said, it may be OK, but we like it as it is, and mm. we really don't want too much more. And more particularly, it's a bit unfair on nearby residents who have to put up with the noise that comes from this airport. Uh, our strap line has always been enough is enough. They're already running at twice the planning consent level they got back in the late 90s. Mm. We think they've had enough. I think there is more than enough there going through. I've just come through Junction 10A this morning, 7 o'clock, chock-a-block with traffic. 
and road traffic in this area is going to get worse and worse. You've had already comments about road traffic. Mm. Another 6,000 vehicles in and out every day to that area. It's all right to ex- include increase perhaps the access to the airport terminal but then that traffic has got to get to this area mm. and it's already badly clogged in the mornings and evenings but this this there's talk of other airports possibly expanding heathrow is, is is being looked at possibly even new airport don't we need to in, in times like this when when business is down don't we need to get as many people into the country as we can well well you talk about business but in fact most of the traffic certainly from Luton, nearly all the traffic is leisure traffic anyway uh, there's no real problem about businessmen getting in and out of this country uh, from the main international... But tourism as well is important, isn't it? That, yeah, that's... but we, we... I mean, Loon particularly exports tourism in a massive way. We have a de- deficit on the tourism revenue of 17, 18 billion a year because you... People like us, people like Luton people, like to go to abroad. You don't get that many people coming in. So that is exporting wealth all the time. And the aviation industry always tends to get very nervous about these sort of comments, but it's true. It's easily calculatable, and a lot of people have calculated it. It looks as if this planning application is is kind of full steam ahead. What's your plan of action now? Well, when the planning application comes out, we'll have the details and we'll be able to counter a lot of the spin. A lot of talk about the jobs. The jobs number is completely over the top. They're using jobs simply to sell the idea. It's a marketing ploy. Based on previous statistics, nothing like 4,500 jobs. Mm. Airports getting more and more self-service. You put your passport in, it does everything automatically nowadays. But it's a good way of selling the and what to many people, many residents in the area, I think is a very unfair idea. They're already turning in hundreds of complaints each year. When they tweaked a route near Flamster recently, they got three and a half thousand complaints. Mm. So the noise complaints we're already receiving is just the tip of the iceberg. It is a real problem. It is in the wrong place for a major airport, and it's on the top of a hill, and access is terrible. I should just say, some people may be wondering if a mouse has escaped into the studio. It's your tape recorder that you're recording this. It's all right. It's just, it just move it over there. It's just squeaking ever so slightly. That's all. I guess yeah. Some people may be yeah. concerned that we've been uh, uh, invaded. invaded by a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is your main concern about this project, the noise. Absolutely. Well, that is what Ladakan's main remit is. It is the noise. uh, But we also look through some of the other things in the planning application and in the marketing material the airport has churned out. And we will counter as as much of that as we can. We've got a lot on the jobs. We've got a lot on the road congestion that we can include Mm. because we will object, in a sense, to the whole idea. Our general view is enough is enough. In fact, it's more than enough. And they should stick with what they've got. The airport says that aeroplanes are getting quieter. you compare them to what they were 10, 15 years ago. They are, aren't they? They may be fractured quieter now compared to 20, 30 years ago, but they actually run quite a modern fleet. They will not get any quieter. In fact, they are getting noisier because they're getting bigger. The fleet mix is changing, and they're getting fractionally bigger all the, uh, bigger and noisier all the time. So, no, I don't believe they will get quieter. I can't see it happening. Isn't this just a case of nimbyism? Not in my backyard. No, I don't think so. I don't think so, because... Ultimately, the aviation industry got to face up to one or two things on the climatic side. The environment up there is our life support system. Aviation is an increasing major problem with with climate change and Mm. emissions. I think ultimately this country and probably the world in general has got to look at this climate change problem and start saying, do we really want people flitting over to, say, I don't know, somewhere like Prague for a stag weekend? Why don't they have a pint in their local and enjoy that? So in a sense, it's trivialising what is a very important... Mm form of transport for people like businessmen and long distance travel but flitting over to Prague for a weekend seems to us a terrible waste of aviation fuel and damage to the climate Prague is nice though, it is nice for a weekend I've been there for a weekend Well, there you go. You when see. was the last time you went abroad? I went abroad twice this year. Yeah. I went from St Pancras, right. once to France and once to Switzerland. And there was no problem at all. I just got on a train there and I saw the scenery and I saw the Swiss scenery. Not just lots of clouds down there and waiting two or three hours at an airport, wondering what to do. It worked very well. So I've actually been abroad twice this year, happily by rail route. Do you ever fly? I flew two or three years ago from Terminal 5 at Heathrow. There's no alternative, and that is why I realised how automatic it is becoming. It was a big barn of a place, hardly anybody there. You just put this in there, and the machine did that. You put this in there, and the machine did that. When I came back into this country, I put my passport in, and it said, welcome to Britain, and I walked through the gate. Nobody there. Mm. Uh, this is what MP uh, from uh, for Luton South MP uh, Gavin Shuker has to say. So you might want to put your headphones, uh, headphones oh, on this. Yeah. This is his view on the consultation plans. Do you allow Luton Airport to continue as it's currently been uh, in a situation where, you know, 
we all know some of the issues around Lewin Airport, not least of all getting uh, people up here during peak times and the like? Or do you allow it to expand, which means that we can invest much, much more back into the infrastructure and create a better airport, more jobs uh, and uh, more opportunities to pick up the capacity that's there? So broadly, yeah, I do welcome these proposals being brought forward and it's quite right that consultations launch. What do you make of that? Well, simply that phrases like more jobs and a better airport and so on, they have to be looked into. Mm. It is a very constrained site. We do not think this more jobs thing actually The figures works. I've got, these are the yeah. figures that I've been given. Sure. 4,500 extra jobs, better transport and access, huge boost to the local economy of over £218 million and job security for staff. That's got to be a good thing. Four na- well, four and a half thousand jobs. You immediately tackle that f- that that figure based on what we've seen over the last few years at Loon. It has been nothing. It will do nothing like that. And based on these sorts of reports, airport jobs, false hopes, cruel hopes, there would be nothing like four and a half thousand. But it's a good selling ploy. And increase improving the access how are you going to improve the access on such a con- on such a confined site? We don't believe it's going to happen. And more particularly. There can be 60% more flights going over your head, and a lot of people, Whitwell, Stevenage, and Oldham, Hartman, and Hemel, Stodham, all these places in three counties area are going to be pretty fed up with it. It's bad enough as it is, including at night, don't forget. They yeah. run all night. Do you not feel, though, that you're, you're just up against the, uh, the, the machine and you're bashing your head against the brick wall? Are well, you making any progress? Yeah, we think so, because 10 years ago they wanted a second runway at Lewin Airport, and we challenged that, and we raised a lot of funds, and we challenged it in the courts, and it was thrown out because we thought second runway would make a bad situation a great deal worse. So we will challenge it this time round. As I say, our strap line is enough is enough. And mm. we think it would be much better if it was content to run as it is without taking on this massive increase. After all, you're doubling the number of passengers. Another 6,000 vehicles on the roads nearby every day. Is that going to be good news for you getting into three counties? <laughs> well, <right here? laughs> the, the time I come in, the roads are pretty empty. But yes, well, I, I, I totally take your point, yeah. John. But the, it can't stay the same size forever. Can it? The world is growing. There are more and more people. There are more and more journeys being made. And I, I appreciate yeah. what you say about we. Ca- of course, we. I was being slightly flippant about going to Prague. I have been, but yeah. of course, we can cut down on journeys. But yeah. the world doesn't work like that, does it? Well, it may have to in the future, mind it. Uh, things like oil. I'm going to a meeting next week about peak oil. We're getting to the stage where we can't get any more oil out of the rate we used to get it out. Aircraft depend on oil. There's no real way they're going to depend on anything else. They talk about biofuels. That means planting lots of biofuel crops in, in fields where normally you, you, you know, pr- plant food crops. Mm. So instead of being able to eat, you're going to have more aeroplanes. That's a nonsense situation. I think the world... I don't have children and grandchildren, sadly, but I think the next generations are going to look very carefully at what we're doing now and saying, was this sensible? Mm. And I think the future generations are going to say, what a legacy that lot have left us. We've run out of oil. We've got all these planes flying around. The climate's messed up. Um, droughts, all the rest of it, that climate change will inevitably cause. John, thank you very much for coming in. We thank shall you. follow this, this story closely, and I'm sure we'll speak to you again at some point I in the future. I expect you will. There we go. Thank Fantastic. You. That's John Davis, who is from Ladakan, the Luton and District Association for the control of airport noise well what do you think uh, does it make sense to expand the airport or do you agree with john that actually enough is enough we don't need any more done it's big enough as it is we should all cut back on our uh, international travel and we're a little bit blasé about it you can text 81333 start your text 3cr or you can give me a call 08459 455 555 okay this morning we're talking first aid and we're talking gcse's if you're doing your GCSEs now, or you've just done them, could you give us a call? Were they easy? I bet they weren't. Let's get the latest news now with Catherine Boyle. Good morning, dear listener. I'm just arguing with our work experience lad as to whether he's going to help me out on this next, next item or not. He will be. Don't worry. Uh, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. It's Monday the 17th of September. Lots of stuff in the last hour, apart from Jonathan Vernon Smith popping in and making the studio smell nice. Have you seen the new St John Ambulance first aid camp campaign? It's an advert that uh, is quite moving, quite powerful, and it shows a man choking to death at a barbecue. The aim is to get more of us to learn first aid. I'm asking this morning, when has first aid helped you? Maybe you've been in a position where you've seen someone in trouble and you've thought, oh, I know what to do here. Could you give me a call? You can show off a bit if you want, and ba- bask in your glory. 08459 455 555. And also, GCSEs are going to be replaced by a new qualification similar to the old O-level. I'd 
I'd love to speak to someone who's taken their GCSEs and another person who has taken the O levels. 81333, start your text 3CR, or you can give me a call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, it's a sad fact that one of the biggest causes of death in the UK could be avoided. Up to 140,000 people are dying each year when first aid could have helped to save their lives. That's according to St John Ambulance. And if we've learnt nothing else today, we know it's St John, not St John's. The charity says this is the same number that die from cancer and have launched a campaign aired last night to encourage more people to learn the basic skills. I'm joined now by Hannah Sears, who is a first aid trainer for Active Luton. Uh, she's in the studio now with her five-year-old son, Ryan, who knows first aid. Now, Ryan may or may not speak. Mm-hmm. Depends how he feels. That's entirely up to him. That's cool. Uh, but uh, Hannah, Ryan is five. He is, And he yes. can do first aid already. Um, f- probably from the age of around three. Wow. But that's just really um, natural curiosity, I think, because he wanted to know what mummy did at work. And So he know. would see you doing bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. And he'd go, well, what's that? And you would show yeah, him? Yeah, he would say to me, Mummy, what did you do at work today? And i say, would you like me to show you? And he'd lie on the floor and I'd show him. Wow. And I never pushed it on him at all. Um, but then he'd get me to lie on the floor and then he'd do it to me. And what kind of stuff can Ryan do? Um, he can... That's Ooh. right, that's Ryan. Yeah, that's Ryan right talking now. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> um, he knows that he needs to check for danger. Yeah. He knows how to see if someone is responsive or not. Um, he knows how to open an airway and check for breathing. How... Uh, really? Yeah. Can you open an airway and check for breathing, Ryan? How do you do that? What do you do? How many hands do you use, Ryan? He's holding up both of his hands there. Yeah. And what do you do? Do, do you have to, 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 to check if someone's breathing? How do you do that? You touch their... What are you touching? Their forehead? Their, are you open their mouths? Yeah, we do a head tilt oh, and a chin lift. Oh, my goodness that's right, gracious. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's very useful that you know that. Well done. He knows the recovery position as well, apparently. He does. I've never formally talked him it. Right. But because he sort of lay on the ground at home and said, Mummy, Mummy, show me what you do. Yeah. Um, whenever he's got me to lie down, he just naturally he put me in the recovery isn't position. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. Yeah. He's sorted then, isn't he? Yes. He knows all of that stuff. <laughs> now, so d- tell me what Active Luton is. Um, Active Luton, we're a char- charitable trust. Yep. Um, many people throughout Luton may know it through our leisure centres and our facilities. Um, we have a training team, which I'm part of, mm. our workforce development team. Um, so, of course, we go out delivering um, lots of <coughs> courses across the home counties and further afield, if need be. Um, predominantly first aid, but yep. other things as well. Yeah. So you go into schools and places like that. What kind of age groups are you um, we, teaching? We can teach from three upwards. Yeah. Um, so, primarily, it'll be years... Reception class in year one is perfect yeah. to get started. We can teach younger. Um, but we've gone into schools and done after-school clubs, holiday clubs, um, things like that. Um, and I bet the kids love it, don't they? They absolutely do, yes. Um, it's funny how um, they might not be so interested in their lessons until they do an hour and a half with me, and yeah. then I can't get rid of them. Right, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, and sometimes, you know, they want to learn more. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, everything is very practical. It's very hands-on. We use lots of props, like, you know, real human x-rays to show them the inside of the Ooh, body. yeah, see, that's um, good. Skeleton puzzles and, you know... Um, and, of course, they use each other yeah. as casualties and they bandage each other up. You know, they absolutely love it. Ryan, can you do bandages? You can do bandages. Fantastic. Mm. Are you proud of your mummy? Does she, does she do a good job? He is nodding enthusiastically. Lots of nodding. Lots yes. of nodding. Yes. Fantastic. Now, uh, have you seen the St John Ambulance advert that was I on last night? I saw it last night. Well, I, I, I know, I've not seen it. I've had it described yeah. to me. What did you make of it? It was very powerful. Yep. I thought it was, it, it was very good. Um, you know, and, in fact, I rewound it. And watched it again, right. you know, because I found it fascinating. Wow, you, you, you held off on Downton Abbey to, to re-watch the advert. I did, well yes. Done. <laughs> it was good then. It was. It was very powerful. And hopefully it will get the message to people. Yep. Obviously, I don't work for St, um, for St John's, so yep. I can't comment on their statistics or anything yep. like that. Um, but all I can say is any advocate for first aid is, sounds great to me. Excellent. Yeah. Well, if it gets people doing it. Now, listen, we've got uh, Ollie here, who's our work experience lad. Could you, could you show us? Are you all right, Ryan? You're okay. I know it's I know it's early and it's it's boring <laughs> grown ups talking. I totally understand. I feel the same way every day. Ollie, can I should I injure him or do we just pretend he's injured? Do I do I slap him or how does this work? Well, you best? could lie on the floor and you could pretend that you've just found him. That <laughs> we can do that great. very Ollie, would you like to lie on the floor please? And let's let's he's bumped his head and he's passed out. Okay. Right. Right. So okay. what what do I do? Well, the first thing you should do Talk me talk me through it. I'll talk, talk you through it. Yeah, yeah, go on. 
The first thing you should do before you go near him, of course. Ryan, could you come and give me a hand? Are you, are you able to come and help? Go and help, come good and boy. Come and look, make sure I do it all properly, Ryan. Thank you. So go on, yes, he's on the first floor. First thing you do? should do is we follow letters in first aid, so hopefully yep. this might be able to help you, and yep. that is D-R-S... D-R-S. ...A-B-C. Mm. Doctors Catty. A-B-C. Yes. OK? So the D stands for danger. Danger. Meaning that you should be having a good look to see if there's any danger to you or your casualty before you approach, and, of course, anyone else that may be around you. Ryan, can we see any danger around here? There's no, he's, he's shaking his head vigorously. There is, there is no, no danger. danger. OK, yes, what else? So R stands for response. Yes. Which means you need to check, check, check for response. So okay. if you can shake him by the shoulders and say, are you all right? Are you all right, Ollie? Ollie, I need a cup of tea. Are you all right? <laughs> he's not all right. He's not responding. He's not responding, is he, Ryan? He I shouldn't, say, <laughs> I shouldn't say I need a cup of tea. That was inappropriate, was it? Okay. Okay. Thank so you, Ryan. Yes. we do the S part, yes. which is shout for Ryan. We shout for help. Can you help. do it really loudly, Ryan? Help. Can you do it louder than that? Help. The loudest shout you can do. Help. There we go. There Fantastic. We go. We need Thank to you, shout Ryan. For help. Yes. Now we do our A B C part. Yes. So A stands for airway, which yeah. means we need to open Ollie's airway with two hands, right. a head tilt, and a chin lift. Can you, Ryan, can you show me on Ollie how to do it? Ryan is walking over to Ollie. Good boy, Ryan. And he's going to do the head tilt. And we, fantastic. So what you're doing is, with one hand, you're just pulling his head back a bit so That's it's a bit right. of a tilt. And the other hand, you're pulling his mouth open so that his air wave is open. And lifting the chin. It's really important to lift that Excellent. chin. Excellent. Well done. Fantastic. We go. Good work, Ryan. What do we do? He's brilliant. Yes. What do, <laughs> can I have him? <laughs> what does he do? What do we do next? We'll move on to B, which is for breathing. Right. So we need to, while we've got that airway open, we need Stop to... Stop laughing, Ollie. You're unconscious. <laughs> we need to check for breathing. Yes. And how long do we need to check for breathing for, Ryan? How many seconds? Ten seconds. Ten and what do we seconds. do, Ryan? Tell me what we do. Because I haven't got a clue. Open the airway and we count out loud. OK. OK. Can you do that, Ryan? OK, so Ryan is moving back Good over boy. to me. He's a very brave boy for doing it, because let's be honest, it's... OK. Oh, we're not doing that bit yet, Ryan. Oh, what, now, OK, so let's assume that Ollie is still breathing. What was... What did Ryan move on to then? Is that Ryan the was assuming that Ollie was not breathing. Oh, OK. So oh. Ryan was attempting to start CPR. Oh, for <laughs> <laughs> do CPR. Well, he um, he knows where to put his hands. Ryan, yeah. you are amazing. You really <laughs> are amazing. I'm going to introduce you to my little boy, and you're going to teach him some of this. So, okay, let's. So he's he's not breathing. So, should we look at the CPR? Should we see how that goes? Well, see, we can't obviously do that on no. Ollie because that would not be safe. Would that not of be course, safe? It would not be safe oh. to do that on Ollie. Not even um, a little bit. When we practice, no. yeah, we wouldn't like to compress on his chest. No, we wouldn't. Yeah, we want we him wouldn't. to last the rest of the day. Well, hopefully. so um, yes. as Ryan showed, you would place the hands in the centre of the chest. Yep. Heel of the hand, another hand on top, interlock yep. the fingers if you it's can. It's that staying alive thing, isn't it, that from that advert? Exactly. Vinnie Jones has yep. been a great advocate for first aid. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look at that poor lad worry, down there. We compress on their chest <laughs> hard and fast. Um, the speed we're aiming for is around 100 to 120 compressions a minute. So okay. It's quite fast. Yeah. And the depth we're aiming for is about five to six centimetres. And we do that 30 times. Right. So I'm, I'm, la- I'm laughing at that because this is very serious. But I, I, this poor lad is stretched on the floor being tended to by a five-year-old. Do that 30 times. Right. Yeah. After you've done your 30 compressions, if you were willing to give rescue breaths, meaning if you felt safe to do so, you were happy to do so, or maybe you had a barrier, a face shield, yep. or something like that, you would then administer two this rescue This is the old breaths. mouth-to-mouth. Now, I heard that this... Maybe I heard this wrong that this was actually v- fairly ineffective and so it kind of stopped doing it. Not Is really. That not the, case? The, the, the main reason there's been um, a real focus on chest compressions and that's yep. a real important part of CPR. If you can put two breaths in, and we still teach on first aid courses to put two breaths in because okay. it is more effective to put those breaths in. But if you are unwilling to do so, yeah. meaning it's not safe for yourself, yeah. you haven't got a barrier, you're not happy to do so, rather than do nothing, yeah. just do sets of compressions. I am, I am okay. willing to give Ollie mouth to mouth. Fantastic. So I do, what do I do? I pinch his nose. Head tilt, chin lift, make sure that airway's open, pinch the nose. <laughs> <laughs> I barely know the lad. Um, I'm not going to ask Ryan to do it because no. he would. No, oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Ryan, listen, Ryan, do you want to come back and sit over here next to your mummy? Yeah. Ollie, you can get up now. Thank you, Ollie. Well done. We've, we know how to good. save your life. There we, you go. We, you can come and do work experience with me and be my, my <laughs> casualty every day. Ryan, I, I'll be honest. Uh, when I heard that you were coming in and you could do first aid, I kind of thought, yeah, OK. You're fantastic at it, though. You can really do this stuff, can't you? Does it make you feel um, more safe that, knowing that you can do these things? What do you could, think? Does it make, could you do one more thing for me? Could you shout help really, really loudly again? Help! Do it really loud. Help! 
This is as loud as you can. Ah! <laughs> there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, listen, thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful to meet you both. You're brilliant, young man. I, I really, my boy's two and a half, but I'm going to start getting him to do bits and pieces because I think that knowing that you started at three, I think you're a real inspiration. So thank you so much. Are you off to school now, Ryan? What school do you go to? Bushley Primary School. And do you like it? What's your favourite uh, subject? Mm. Do you like reading? Mm. PE, I think. P- P- have you got yeah. PE today? And yeah. who, who's your teacher? Uh, Mrs Anderson. Mrs Anderson. Is she a good teacher? Oh, she's just moved up to you. So it's all a bit new. It is, you, yes. OK, well, listen, you have a fantastic <laughs> day. Thank you both for coming Thank in. Thank you That's very wonderful. Much. There we go. Isn't that superb? Uh, that's Hannah Sears and her son, Ryan, who's five and knows far more first aid than I do. Right. It's 8.16. It's Monday, the 17th of September. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. The St John Ambulance's new awareness campaign claims that up to 140,000 people die every year when first aid could have helped save their lives. Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are going to a French court later today to seek an injunction against the magazine that published photographs of the Duchess topless. Stevenage FC could be moving out of Broad Hallway and into a new stadium depending on whether there's enough support to justify relocation. Coming up, we'll have weather in a few minutes and later on in the show, EasyJet says it's backing new plans for the expansion of Luton, Air- Luton Airport before from uh, oh dearie me my tongue seems to have dropped out of my mouth before 8.30 we'll hear from Luton Airport on the issue BBC Three Counties Radio Roberto Peroni weekdays from 3 ah! on BBC Three we're Counties not laugh- Radio we're not laughing at Roberto although of course if he did something amusing on his show I would be laughing what I'm saying is <laughs> just make it, whatever I say I'm going to sound terrible what I'm saying is <laughs> Jonathan Vernon Smith is in the studio and Kel Surprise just before we went on air he, he said something very rude Jonathan did you <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep doing that I didn't mean that to sound rude you made you made you, you said something that could have been uh, misconstrued and you misconstrued it <laughs> I promise you I didn't do that <laughs> <laughs> no, Miss. Constru- <laughs> did you have Did you have a nice weekend, Jonathan? Yes, 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 I had a lovely weekend. What did you get up to? Any boozy parties? Uh, well, I, I went. Out, yes, I went out uh, for for a good old party on Saturday night. Was this in Was this in Windsor? You went to Windsor. Didn't I did you? go to Windsor. Yes, yes, I went to Windsor first. I didn't party with Her Majesty. I went to college in Windsor. Did you really? I, did, I redid my A levels in it's Windsor. It's very posh. Yes, it yes. is very very posh. Yes. Uh, Saturday, no, on Saturday I went out for a meal. Yes. Yesterday I spent the whole day in Kent. I spent the whole day there. I went to uh, oh. Canterbury. I went to uh, I went to a vineyard for lunch. <gasps> uh, Goodness gracious, that's a terrible mistake. Lovely. And uh, Royal Tunbridge Wells yesterday afternoon. Look at you doing the little tours. No, wonderful. And now I'm exhausted. Good. Did you have a nice weekend? Yes. What did you do? You were on telly. I was on telly. I was on telly very late on Saturday night, and then Sunday it was my niece's fifth birthday party. So I was play, playing ukulele for a load of five-year-old girls. Do you play ukulele? I do play ukulele. Yes, <gasps> yes. Brilliant. It's great. You must bring in your ukulele. I'll bring in my keyboard. Let's have a <laughs> let's have a sesh. I don't know any Neil Sedaka songs. <laughs> I only know heads and shoulders, really, and zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> but yes, let's. let's I have can play sesh. heads and shoulders. We're in heads, shoulders, knees, knees and toes, knees and yeah, toes. Yes, yes. That's, that's no problem. <sighs> If you're still listening, uh, Jonathan, <laughs> everyone switched over to the other stations that are available, yes. yes. What's on your show today, Jonathan? Coming up on the big phone in at nine, do today's nurses still show skill and compassion? A new campaign has been launched by the Royal College of Nursing, which aims to give the public a clear picture of the reality of nursing. It wants to show the skill and compassion of members of its profession. The campaign comes at a time when the Patients Association says its helpline is busy than ever logging complaints about nursing standards. So on the big phone in this morning at nine, I want to hear your views. Do today's nurses still show skill and compassion? If you've been in hospital or somebody in your family has been in hospital recently, do they still show that skill and compassion they once were known for? Are they still? 08459 455 555. I'd like your views and your experiences on the big phone in at nine. Nurses are amazing and they don't get paid anywhere near enough for the, the fantastic job they do. But I have had several experiences where the, there has been a, a complete lack of compassion. When we had our first baby, my wife was, was in hospital overnight with the baby next to her. She didn't have a clue what to do, OK? Uh, and at three o'clock in the morning, she rang the alarm. 
15 minutes later, a nurse came along and said, don't ring the alarm. If you see one of us walking past, grab us, but please don't ring the alarm. And you think, well, they're, they're, hang on a second. No, yes, ring the alarm whenever you want. And I've, got a f- I've had a few examples of nurses kind of being like that. And it's not all of them. It's only a few. And most of them are fantastic and do a brilliant job. But they're the ones you remember, obviously, of because course they are. when you're in hospital and you're either, I mean, your wife wasn't ill, but no. she was probably feeling very vulnerable. Of course. She and was. if you're ill, you're feeling very vulnerable and you just need people to help you, don't you? And look yep. after you and make you feel a little less unwell or a little less vulnerable. And if you press your buzzer and then you get chastised by the nurse, I mean, that's going to make you feel very unwelcome where you are. I blame Barbara Windsor. Barbara Windsor? Yeah, I do, because in the 70s, she kind of sexed nurses up, didn't she, in those carry-on films with the stockings and the little frilly skirts and stuff like that. And I think that nurses have had to toughen up as a direct result of of carry-on doctor. (laughs) I do. I think that's part of it. I think their image has been affected by it. Right. Follow that theme at night. We'll we'll discuss that at night. Is Barbara Windsor (laughs) single-handedly responsible for the problems nurses face today? (laughs) Thank you, Jonathan. See you later on. Have fun. Uh, Wait, 459-455-555 is the phone number. We will speak to you after this. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, earlier on in the show, we were talking about the uh, the roadworks in Dunstable that are affecting where well, we focused on a chip shop, and I am uh, desperately anticipating my pickled egg. I know a pickled egg for breakfast, but... Come on, it's, it's, it's very rare you get to do that. But, but a lot of the shops there are, are suffering because of the roadworks. Pat is in Dunstable. Good morning, Pat. Hello, Ian. I'm in Outer Regis, actually. <laughs> oh, OK, you're in Houghton Regis, but you've called in about Dunstable. What's your take on it? Yeah, I, I actually feel sorry for the, the traders there, you know. They've not really had the help that they've required. I mean, it's going to take more than just giving the odd weekend for free parking. Um, what they've had to suffer with is all these road closures due to the busway, mm. all these redesigns on the road network. And when they took their businesses up, they didn't expect this kind of thing to happen. They actually expected councillors to put in plans that would help their regeneration, if you like, as shopkeepers. And it's clearly it's not happening. So is, is there any hope for Dunstable? There's no hope at all. We've got Morrison's opening in Houghton Regis. Thank goodness. I mean, this would be the size from probably many residents in Houghton Regis. We don't have to go to Dunstable and face those traffic queues like we used wow. to. And that means a death knell even more for Dunstable. And it's got to be a complete redesign of the area. It's no good just putting in, as I say, these temporary road conditions that they have. The busway is not going to help them at all because the busway is designed to drive people into Luton. And a lot of people don't like Luton anyway. So where do people go? Well, if they want a nice shopping area to go to, then they go to Milton Keynes, which is nice and friendly to the shoppers. But Pat, listen, thank you very much. We're moving on just because we, uh, we want to get as many people on the show as we can. Pat thinks it's the death knell for Dunstall. It's a bit dramatic, but is that the case? 08459 455 555. Now, EasyJet says it's backing new plans for the expansion of Luton Airport. The owners and operators are about to submit a full planning application which would increase passenger numbers from 10 to 18 million a year. Fiona McGlone is from London Luton Airport. She joins me now. Good morning, Fiona. Good morning. Uh, Fiona, now the, the airport owners, the operators and EasyJet have agreed on the plans. What does that mean? Um, that means that we have a, a common view about how London Luton Airport could best play to its advantage in the local and national southeast um, requirement for aviation. So, on that basis, uh, London Luton Airport Operators Limited are going to submit a plan following public consultation um, around improving and, and a- accessing our airport, providing something that's better for passengers um, and ultimately bigger in order co- to create better capacity. Well, earlier on we spoke to John Davis from uh, Ladakan, who is obviously against the plans. Let's have a quick listen to what he had to say. Uh, our strap line has always been enough is enough. They're already running at twice the planning consent level they got back in the late 90s. Mm. I've just come through Junction 10A this morning, 7 o'clock, chock a block with traffic. And road traffic in this area is going to get worse and worse. You've had already comments about road traffic. Mm. Another 6,000 vehicles in and out every day to that area. It's all right to ex- include, increase perhaps the access to the airport terminal, but then that traffic has got to get to this area. He's worried about traffic, he's worried about noise, uh, and he's just terrified that it's going to ruin the area, Fiona. 
Okay. I mean, the first thing that we need to say is that um, increasing the infrastructure and increasing uh, the terminal is what we're doing, um, is our primary focus. So the implementation moving to 18 million passengers is over a long time. It's through till 2025. And the first steps are around improving access by road um, through to the airport. So that's not just from um, the terminal access. We're also looking at improving Junction 10A, which is part of the council's responsibility. Um, passenger numbers, our busiest hours are through from 6.30 through to 7.30. And so the traffic that's standing at 7 o'clock hopefully isn't passengers because they will have come in and cleared through the area a number of hours in advance of that. More night flights? Night flights is an interesting one. Night flights are doing an awful lot of work with to reduce noise um, and to reduce impact. And we are currently very successful um, in doing that. I accept that at, no at night, any noise is difficult to manage. Um, on average, there are six flights of an evening that fly between half past 11 and um, prior to six in the morning. And the noise mitigation measures that we have will make a significant difference to how, uh, how that noise is experienced. But, but still, planes at night are planes at night. It's going to be noisy, isn't it, Fiona? It, it's, it'll be less noisy than it is now. Um, With more planes? Um, I'm not 100% sure that, we are, that, that there's an intention to fly additional planes at night. What we are looking at is a quota system which minimises the noise across the whole of the, uh, the night time. It's operated currently in other London airports. Oh, oh, Fiona, we seem to uh, be uh, having trouble with the line there, so I, I think we should let you go, Fiona. But thank you very much. I think you put your point across uh, very well uh, indeed. That was Fiona McGlone from London Luton Airport. What do you think? Do you live nearby? Are you worried about these plans? You can give me a call 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Sorry, did, I, I don't know much about sport. But did a man get taken off because he had a dead leg? Really? Really? I, I don't... I, listen, I don't want to be flippant. I hope that nothing serious has happened, but we used to get dead legs at school all the time and you would carry on and laugh it off. Well, dearie me. Coming up in the last half an hour of the show before Jonathan Vernon-Smith, we'll be talking more about GCSEs, more about Stevenage, uh, and more importantly, Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> Now, it's kind of our plan that we're going to have a look at this every week, but my life is far too busy to watch this nonsense. So I've employed the services of several people under the age of ten. I think we've got about six of them, uh, and they are going to be my Strictly Come Dancing reporting team. We're going to have different ones each week. This week, we've got all the way from St Albans, uh, it's Kiana and her sister Sienna. Good morning, Kiana. Morning, Ian. Morning, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Why aren't you at school yet? Uh, we're waiting in the car. Okay. It's school. What time does school start these days? Um, quarter to nine. Quarter to... Oh, okay, so we haven't got long. And I bet you're... Uh, uh, would, do you think the GCSEs are too easy these days? Yeah. Okay. You're ten years old, you know that, don't you? Yeah. Okay, you shouldn't be asking for harder exams at your age. You should be making it as easy as possible. Now, Strictly Come Dancing, Kiana. First of all, did you do your homework? Did you watch it? Yes, definitely. I watched it about three times. What? Why? I, I don't know. You like it that much? You watched it three times? Yeah. Is that old man still presenting it? Who, Bruce? Bruce, yeah. Bruce is he, he's still doing it, is he? Yeah, with Tess Daly. OK, and we, we like Bruce and Tess, don't we? They're a good couple. Yeah. OK, so what, tell me what happened in this, the first episode of the series. Well, I thought it was funny when Bruno got out of his seat all excited because I knew he would do that. Right, so Bruno is, is um, one of the... He's the eccentric judge, isn't he? He's very loud and yeah. flamboyant. Yes, he got yeah. out of his seat, right? Um, I thought that Danny Harmer and Vincent would definitely be a good couple. Right. And Louis, Louis Smith and Flavia and Kimberly Walsh and Pasha, they all be a good couple. OK, now, I, 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 knew who, I knew who Kimberly Walsh was because she was in um, The Girls Allowed. Yeah. Uh, but who is... Uh, who, what other, who else did you mention? Harmer. Who's Danny Harmer? She plays Tracy Beaker in one of the... Um, what? What? Tracy, Tracy Beaker. Trace, I know who Tracy Beaker is. She's a children's TV show. Tracy Beaker is on Strictly Come Dancing? Yep. 
Wowzers. Okay, there's a shock. Okay, I'm going to run past a couple of names, Kiana, who I know are yep. also uh, taking part. Do you know who Louis Smith is? Yeah, he's um, uh, the gymnast, okay. for, and he won silver medal. Okay, who yeah. who is Sid Owen? He's um, Ricky in oh, Okay, all right. Oh, uh, here's one. Who's Richard Arnold? Who? Yeah, exactly. Kiana, can we speak to your sister, please? Yeah, sure. Excellent work. Thank you. That's Kiana, who's ten. We're going to speak to Sienna now, who's seven. Morning, Sienna. Morning, Liam. How are you today? Good. Did you have a Fine. nice? Did you have a nice weekend? <laughs> yeah. What did you do? We w- I I went to my I went to my friend Isabella and Ronnie's party. Oh, superb. Uh, and we ha- and we went sledging in the snow. Uh, sorry, what? You went we sledging went to... in the snow? It's not, Senna, I don't, it's not been snowing. We went to, um, oh, where did we go? We went to Gatland. a snow, sle- oh. snow centre. We went to the snow centre, that makes a bit more sense. Did you watch Strictly Come Dancing? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I loved it. What, tell me your favourite bits. My favourite bit was Darcy, because she's a ballerina just like me. <laughs> oh, yes! Uh, and so you enjoyed that. Did you like... Or, did, can you describe some of the dresses to us, Sienna? That's what I really want to know. What did the dresses look like? Sparkly, opened, so they could see their belly button and everything. Ooh. Blimey. Um, <laughs> do, and what did you think of the celebrities? Have they got a good lineup of celebrities this year, Sienna? Yeah, my favourite one was Danny Harmer. That's Tracy Beaker, of course. Yeah. We're all a big fan of Tracy Beaker. Um, did you know who all of them were? Uh, no, because some of them are old people and I'm only seven, so... I... no. <laughs> what age, Sienna, what age do you consider to be old? Thirty-nine. That, again, now, that's my age. Why do you say that? <laughs> Why do you say that specifically? My mum told me to because oh. he knew you were that age. I've gone right off your mum. OK, let's go through some of the names. Richard Arnold, who's he? Uh, it's, he's a cricketer, isn't he? Who's Michael Vaughan? Cricketer. OK, so, uh, who's Lisa Riley? Lisa Riley. She for, is from Emmerdale. She's Ooh. from Emmerdale. Colin Salmon. Now, I don't know who Colin Salmon is. Oh, actor, actor, yeah, actor. M- might as well. Is your mum helping you? <laughs> mum, stop it, right, here's one, here's one. I don't want your mum to help. Last one, who's Johnny Ball? Johnny Ball's a TV presenter. OK, we'll let you have that one. Uh, so, basically, Sienna, you give it the thumbs up. Do you think it's going to be a really good series? Yeah. All right, well, listen, you take care. Lots of love to you and your sister, and we'll speak to you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Ian. I put the wrong fader down. Bye-bye. <laughs> they could have been left hosting the show. That's Kiani and Sienna. They're her two of our Strictly Come Dancing correspondents, and I think you'll agree. They are absolutely superb, aren't they? Wonderful. We've got a whole team of those, and we'll be following it. It, it seems the, the, the easiest way to follow this series. Now, GCSEs make headlines every year, mainly because they are supposedly getting easier. But today the government has announced that they will be abolished to be replaced by something that's more similar to the old O-level style exams. Chris McGovern is from the Campaign for Real Education. He's on the line now. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. What do you make of today's news? Well, it's good news as far as we're concerned. It's 25 years too late, because 25 years ago the government banned the use of O-levels in this country, but... We still sell them abroad, all over the world. You can sit O-level. Today, Michael Goh is going to bring back an O-level style exam, so um, the campaign for real education very much welcomes that. Uh, do you think it's, it's going to be similar to the O-levels, is it, this, this uh, exam that's going to be introduced in 2015? Well, it's going to be broader, and it's going to cater for more children. O-level, it's true, O-level only catered for the top 25%, 30%. This is going to cater for more children, and some children will have to probably work a year longer, so rather than doing it as a two-year course, we'll have to take the exam when they're 17 after a three-year course. If you go to Singapore, for example, which is a very successful economy, yeah. they, do our, they do our O-level, and uh, about 80% of their children do O-level. Uh, we sell them that exam. Um, now, that means we want to do something similar to that, so we want most of our children to do an O-level style exam, but it's going to be very demanding. You, uh, do you think that the GCSEs are too easy? 
Oh, the miles too easy. I mean, that, that's hardly worth the paper they're written on, to be honest. And that doesn't, I don't want to denigrate what children do, because children do all they, 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 they've got an exam in front of them, they do it. But we've had, we've got a 98% pass rate. Right. Um, we've had inflation for 24 years, every year for 24 years, they've gone up and up and up, the pass rate's got better, and slight dip this year has caused a huge row. But, you know, it's, it's lost all credibility, and employers are particularly concerned that children are, or youngsters are coming into work and they're unskilled. Have you ever sat at GCSE, Chris? Yeah, I have. And, and Interesting, isn't it? I, yeah, I have got an A star. And what, Didn't in, I do well. In, in what subject? It was in Italian, which is where I'm talking to you now from Italy, actually. Oh. And, uh, I, yeah, I, and uh, I took a GCSE cell several years ago, uh, just as out of interest, and I, and I did it. Yeah, I've also did O-levels. Um, and, and I'm not so... I went to grammar school, but I also went to secondary modern school. So not, you know, I, I understand the difficulties of lower ability children. Um, but, you know, people talk about the situation as though we have a choice. We do not have a choice. We can only... We only have the pathway of improving the exam system. Otherwise, the economy of this country is finished. We you have to do something. Chris, you can't blame the, the, the economy situation at the moment on GCSEs. Uh, you have to have an educated workforce, yes. and you have to export, and if you don't have an educated uh, uh, workforce and can export goods, your economy suffers. If you look at the successful economies, yeah. then they have very good education systems. So, yes, you, can. you can't blame on GCCs, Chris, it's a worldwide crisis. Uh, not a worldwide crisis. There's booming economies in in in, in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, and in Latin America. There are booming well, economies. In, India's, yeah. India's economy is slowing right down. Slowing right down, but I mean, it's all relative, of course. They, they think of a slowdown to be something like six or seven percent growth. Um, we have, you, I, I, indeed, you can blame the GCSE system on some of our economic problems because yeah. employers are finding that the youngsters coming in are unskilled. You can't produce, you can't have a successful economy without a really well educated workforce. It's but, fundamental. Chris, some, some people, uh, including myself, yeah. I can't work my head. I, ca- I haven't got an exam head. I can't do exams. But it doesn't mean I'm not intelligent. It doesn't mean I'm not bright. It doesn't mean I'm not clever. But uh, exams are not suited to me. I passed my 12 plus and I went to a grammar school, but I still couldn't do exams. So yeah. people like myself would suffer unfairly, wouldn't they? You, you wouldn't do so well in academic exams, but there are always, always going to be exceptions. The exceptions matter, of course. But there are many children who do not benefit from highly academic courses. They need to do more vocational courses. And, and we don't want to get obsessed by this. We, what we want to say is that if children study English, they need to be able to write a sentence. If they study mathematics, they need to be able to add up. Pretty basic stuff. And the GCSE system, and it permeates the entire school culture, is, has made a, a creation education world where actually standards do not really matter they just get lower and lower and lower well, I, I get, we had a, a text from a, a teacher in, uh, earlier on in the show who said isn't the gcse's that are the problems with with maths and basic uh, uh, basic reading that that starts that's in primary school that they should be encouraged listen i did gcse's and and uh, I, I do think it's slightly unfair to say that gcse's do not promote uh, being able to read and write and do maths of course they do well, you're saying that, and I understand why you're saying it, oh, and, and I totally sympathise, but look, it's a very hard lesson. There, there you've got some chap coming on the radio and saying, look, actually, we're producing an uneducated workforce, and it's a pretty tough lesson, isn't it? But come on, wake up, you know, you've got to get real. We've got to get an economy which is served by educated people. If you learn a foreign language, you but need so to be able to speak I'm, it. But you're saying that you're now directly saying that I'm not educated. No, I'm, what I'm saying, I, don't, I can't say no, no, nothing, nothing about it. What I'm saying is that if you rely on GCSE as a standard of education, it is not sufficient. 98% of children are passing, passing this exam, but in international league tables, we are falling. Chris, fascinating to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's Chris McGovern, who is from the Campaign for Real Education. He says the whole, one of the main reasons uh, for this whole economic crisis in this country is GCSEs. Really? What do you think about that? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. And I do. Kind of, I take it as a slight like personal side because I don't think GCSEs are that easy. I mean, I haven't. I did, did them. I was the second year that we did it. So what was that twenty five years ago? Something ridiculous like that. I don't think they're that easy, really. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. It's se- uh, eight forty six. I do apologise. Oh, Monday the seventeenth of September. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. A new awareness campaign from St John Ambulance is claiming around 140,000 people die every year when first aid could have helped save their lives. 
Lawyers for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will go to court in Paris today to try to restrict the publication of pictures showing the Duchess sunbathing topless. In sport, Stevenage chairman Phil Wallace says a new stadium could be on the cards if there was sufficient support to make it financially viable. Your weather today for the three counties, it's mainly dry with sunny spells. Top temperature is 19 degrees. And coming up, nominations for the BBC's Sporting Unsung Hero Awards open today. Before nine, we'll hear the story of someone who won the award two years ago. BBC Three Counties Radio. If you've done GCSEs, it, it, you know they're not they're not that. I mean, it, the, the part of the, the, the situation with them is it's based on coursework, isn't it? It isn't a completely exam experience. And that seems fairer to me, I think. I don't know. We've got ten minutes if you want to give me a call. Oh, wait, uh, 459. 455, 555. Now, nominations for the BBC's Sporting Unsung Hero Awards open today. With all the efforts of the 70,000-odd games makers. Was that how many there were? Wow. Who volunteered at London 2012. It's fair to say this year is going to be particularly tough to judge. But someone who has won the award before is Lance Haggith from Bedford. He's on the line now. Morning, Lance. Morning, Ian. You were given the uh, award two years ago. Tell me why you were nominated and, and why you won. Uh, basically, I was nominated for uh, my commitment to the community for uh, doing sport for uh, many, many years. Too many, uh, probably, <laughs> yeah, uh, about 30-odd years. And who nominated you? Um, to be honest, I, I got uh, uh, about uh, 15 nominations, oh, and, um, and I'm not sure which one uh, actually ended up as the, uh, the winner of the nomination, nominee. How do you find out that you're up for something like this? Do you just get a letter one day saying, oh, dear, dear Lance, uh, you're in the, the final five? How does it work? Um, well, basically, um, the, uh, I got uh, contacted by um, uh, Look East, and they said that uh, I was one of the final three selected from the, from the region, from the many nominations. Um, and then um, uh, you wait, and um, you uh, suddenly get surprised uh, when you weren't expected uh, um, from, uh, from Look East, um, and uh, they say you win. Wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, this year, it's going to be... Almost impossible to choose, isn't it? It's been such an amazing year of sport and people giving freely of themselves to promote this sport. No, it's been fantastic. Uh, I must admit, the uh, the Olympics has certainly um, raised uh, the awareness of sports, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but, um, uh, you know, as far as nominations go, um, who, 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 who can you choose? Um, the, the hardest part would be the, the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. But uh, I think um, the fact that the BBC also recognise um, the... Uh, the people that uh, give up their time, um, the unsung heroes, um, and their recognition for, for helping the community, I think is a fantastic thing, because um, basically there are so many people that, uh, uh, like you saw with the, uh, with the Olympics, who volunteered, and without them, the Olympics wouldn't have been the success it was. How important are awards like the, the Sporting Unsung Hero? Oh, very, very important. Um, you know, like myself, many, many people do it not for the recognition or the award, but, um, but you know, it is nice to be recognised. And in my case, um, it's definitely raised the profile of sports trader, um, and, um, and which means we can help more children to access sport in the community who can't normally. And, um, you know, we have tremendous support from um, companies such as the Noble Solicitors, mm. etc., that uh, help us um, to achieve this. And Lance, you've been busy, haven't you, in the couple of years since you won? What have you been up to? Uh, <laughs> yeah, very busy. You've been opening more um, projects throughout the country. Um, I, I, I received more awards. I, I, I was with the uh, Prime Minister. Uh, oh, look at you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I was a torchbearer. Uh, Wonderful. At Luton, um, which is great. It was a, a day um, where it was uh, uh, very, very uh, manic because it was the Carnival Day. So um, great to be there. And. Uh, um, long may it continue. Well, Lance, listen, it's lovely to talk to you, mate. Thank you very much. That's uh, Lance Haggith, who won the BBC Sporting Unsung Hero Award yesterday, and nominations for the new awards uh, are open today. Talking about first aid after this uh, advert for St John Ambulance last night. Again, if, we, if we've learnt nothing from the advert, we now know it's St John Ambulance, not St John's Ambulance. And boy, do they get upset when you say it wrong. And good for them. Uh, but on the back of this advert that played last night, it's a quite dramatic advert that shows a, a, a chap choking to death, uh, and it's to promote first aid. I'm, I'm going to download that St John Ambulance app later on, which apparently will walk you through kind of basic first aid procedures. We've been getting your phone calls uh, on that. Um, Mike in Bedford texted in, and we got him on the line now. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Ian. Uh, I... wh- what do you make about all of this first aid? Can you do it? 
Uh, yeah, I can do it. I was lucky enough about 40 years ago to start doing first aid courses for the company I worked for. And I jumped at the chance. And the reason I jumped at the chance was not just because of the do it at work, but I was thinking of my children at the time. You know, I've got children growing up at home. They always, you know, have bumps and bruises. You know, my son managed to break his collarbone. Oh, blimey. It t- teaches you what to do, you know. And, and the, the thing is, Ian, it teaches you to be calm. Now, yep. with your own children, if something happens, you may get into a bit of a panic. But the first aid course gives you a way to handle the matter and what to do, you know, and what not to do, sort of thing. Re- not recently, about four years ago, a young girl got knocked down in my road. I heard the bang, went outside, saw people about to pick her up from the road. Now, I can shout very loudly, so I bellowed up, I bellowed up the road, yep. leave her where she is, you know what I mean? Yep. People were probably doing what they thought was right, but they were doing the wrong thing, you know, yep. you leave the patient where they are, you do all that the lady was saying earlier, and all the checks, and you get your ambulance crews there, because they, they, you know, are your backup sort of thing from Thursday. You get your ambulance crews there as quick as you can, but uh, as I say, it teaches you what to do, it takes the fear out of it as well, you know. What the hell am I going to do here? Somebody drops down in front of me. You're right, you're right. It is, it is the, the panic is the thing, isn't it, that, that can be dangerous because you, you don't think clearly. I was thinking anyone who's... Anyone... I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity and did several courses, but I think anyone, you know, who's a parent really should seriously consider yep. doing a first aid course. Might, might be only a two-day, one-day one. I was lucky enough to do longer ones. But, it, you know, it gives you that confidence as well and takes the fear out of it. Mike, listen, thank you very much. Uh, it, it, wise words. Uh, Ross is in Bedford. We're talking about GCSEs. Ross, did, are you a GCSE or an O-level person? GCSE. OK. And uh, what do you think to these, these claims that are being made on the radio this morning, that GCSEs are too easy, Ross? Yeah. Um, insane, to be honest. Um, the people like myself and my friends uh, that did GCSEs... Uh, We've been very successful in all the jobs we've been in, um, but without the coursework, we probably wouldn't have got the decent grade we needed. Um, and for myself, I'm dyslexic and dyspraxic, so dyslexia obviously most people know about, and you know, it's hard enough. Um, dyspraxia, um, one of the big things for me with being dyspraxic is being able to put pen to paper. So under exam conditions, it's almost impossible, but yeah, when you have coursework, you have you know, the time to put it together. And also, the, th- the, the, the people saying that coursework makes it too easy, uh, surely that kind of... Because t- you can't do that coursework overnight. It's done over a, a couple of years in some cases. It teaches you discipline and focus and yeah. to see something through to the end, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, in fact, I'd say it's possibly a hard exam. You know, um, in exam, yes, you, you do it and it's over and done with. With coursework, you have to... Uh, do it, as you say, possibly for up to several years of doing it. Um, and I think that's even better because when you leave, for example, I've even some of my jobs shown my coursework to prove you have done it and it proves the level of, you know, how much effort you put in. Mm. Um, some people, for instance, my sister, for her GCSEs, never studied for them, but yet she got all A's and A stars. Yet, if you looked at her coursework, uh, was pants. <laughs> right, OK. Um, I was just thinking that guy that we had on from the the, 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 the education thing was saying that he got he did a GCSE. Yeah, yeah. He, he called my bluff. I asked if he'd done a GCSE. He was hoping yeah. he'd say no, and of course he had done one. And he got an A star in Italian. But yeah. he, li- he lives in Italy. Of you yeah. think he'd get an A star if he lived in Italy. Yeah. It could be a exactly. Uh, Ross, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, let's go to Brian in High Wycombe. Morning, Brian. Yeah, good morning. Uh, just, uh, sorry. Your take on GCSEs. Well, I'm just supporting what you were saying about... For passing exams. I was taught at the Rabbit School to pass exams. Went into the army over 50 years ago, yeah. uh, although, and uh, lads who were very good at, had a feel for radio, could pass exams a third off the course. Yes. I could pass the exams every week, qualified, but would never be as good as them. Yeah. And still don't really know how, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that I think, as you said earlier, 
you don't have to be past exams to be clever. Oh, you, you don't, and I, I just, you know, I, I consider myself to be bright and intelligent. I can't do exams, Brian. I, I did terribly yeah. in my A-levels. I just managed to scrape through to get to a Mickey Mouse university, you know, and a ridiculous degree. But I, I can't, I still have, Brian, I still have a recurring nightmare at least once a week where I'm back at school uh, and I'm, I'm nearly 40. All my friends from school are there. We've got an exam coming up and I haven't revised for it. They all have. And if I fail the exam, uh, I'm good. everything I've achieved in my life so far will become invalid. That's how much of a scar exams have left in my brain. Yeah, bad. Brian, thank you very much for your call. Okay. Take care. There we go, you see. Yeah, I, I, it does... I was getting slightly angry with the gentleman we had on earlier on. It, it, it does annoy me. It's very easy, isn't it, for people who did O-levels to say, oh, GCSE is very, very easy. Oh, they're, they're so easy. And there's so many people that have done GCSEs. That are, what you're saying now to the kids at school now who are studying for their GCSEs, what you're saying is, yeah, what you're doing is pointless and in a couple of years you'll kind of be written off and we'll have a whole generation doing these new, in inverted commas, O-levels. They'll be the important ones and we can sort of forget about you. You can't blame the financial crisis on GCSEs. Of course it's worldwide. Yeah, there are parts of Asia that are doing brilliantly. China's slowing down. India's slowing way down in terms of economic growth. So you can't blame it on GCSEs. It does get me a little bit uh, uh, upset when, uh, when people kind of dismiss them as much as that. They're, they're, they're not easier than O-levels. They're just different. They're focused and aimed I- I- in a different direction. And I, I did do an 11 plus or 12 plus, whatever it was. I'm, I'm old enough to have done that and got into a, a, a grammar school. Uh, and that exam was easy because it's just verbal reasoning. But the, to dismiss 25 years of examination takers, that seems a little bit unfair and a little bit harsh to, to me, anyway. If you want to see the video of me doing first aid on Ollie, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Back tomorrow at six. Jonathan's up next. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian.